सो लेट्स स्टार्ट विद द क्रिटिकल केयर सेशन मे आई रिक्वेस्ट डॉक्टर सुधा कंसल टू प्लीज टेक द प्लेस शी विल बी मॉडरेटिंग दिस सेशन एंड मैडम इज सीनियर कंसल्टेंट क्रिटिकल केयर हॉस्पिटल डेली मे आई रिक्वेस्ट डॉक्टर राजेश चावला सर टू प्लीज कम एंड स्टार्ट द प्रोसीडिंग्स फॉर द सेशन थैंक यू सर गुड मॉर्निंग Good morning, everyone. I welcome you all to this second day session, and I'm really happy to see so many people after a <coughs> night party. So everyone is really enthusiastic about learning. So we are going to start with critical care session, and the lecture will begin. Lecture will begin with Dr. Rajesh Chawla. He requires no introduction in critical care. I could see so many of his students, you know, who are there. So he's had various positions in critical care. He started critical care society. He started critical care college, and uh, he's been a, always a dignitary figure. He's going to talk on common errors which we see in ICUs. Uh, morning, sir. Good morning, and thank you so much for inviting to this important conference. I'm coming for the second time. Last time I came in India International Center. you know what i am going to talk is nothing new it's we all do and we will do but we need to reduce as far as possible for the better outcome you know we know that common errors which we do in icu could be related to misdiagnosis medical medication errors faulty medical devices infections failure to account for surgical equipment improper medical device placement these are very common errors which we do and uh, we should try to miss diagnosis we can only correct if we read more and if we more experience and uh, be very specific but what i'm going to talk today is what we uh, overdo and leads to the worse outcome in these patients so i'm going to talk about fluid overload very common error we do over sedation irrational use of antibiotics inappropriate blood transfusions over treatment malnutrition and overfeeding prophylaxis for gastrointestinal stress ulcers over use of invasive devices abuse of laboratory testing and immobilization so i am going to talk little bit about everything in little more details and of course the others which i'll talk about is a communication and medication errors iv fluid is of course the mainstay the moment the patient enters we do start the iv fluids particularly for hypovolemia blood loss dehydration sepsis less than 50% patients are categorized or who will respond to the iv fluids and if you give too much of fluid then it leads to endothelial damage with direct involvement of the glycocalyx there is increased vascular permeability and increased pressure in the encapsulated organs and it leads to multi system edema and failure and if a person is developing aki we treat aggressively with iv fluids and they have seen that if you make person of renal failure congestive it's lead to the worst outcome in these patients in one of the recent reverse aki study it has shown and they have shown shown that restrictive fluid therapy strategies were associated with less adverse effect including overall cumulative fluid balance and the mortality in these group of patients surviving sepsis guideline says give 30 ml but you need to see whether this patient really requires 30 ml it is based on a very small evidence and you know when a patient comes you give excessive fluid but then once patient is stabilized you must de de resuscitate you should give diuretic so that person is not too much of a fluid cumulative positive fluid balance and there is a study which has shown that if the positive fluid balance is more than 2 liters after de resuscitation 
it is associated with increased mortality and then there is a hidden fluid we give we give in the icu like iv for the drugs for blood transfusions and uh, for enteral nutritions so every millimeter of fluid what you give in the icu should be justified and overload you must avoid at all cost in these patients that's very important because if person has a bp of let's say 100 by 60 and a mean of 65 passing good amount of urine there is no need to pump in fluid you know you have to see whether this patient really requires fluid because it has become a norm that let me have a uh, the blood pressure little higher which is not uh, there there are a lot of studies which have not shown much improvement in these patients then the second common error which we we do is a, we over sedate patients patients who are ventilated they are on sedation for many days and it leads to not only they are on a prolonged ventilation it leads to the ventilator associated pneumonia and all other complications and large proportion of patients do not require like if a patient is a severe ards for first 48 hours sometime you give paralytic agents then only sedations these are the patient who require sedation because of distress difficult to ventilate or intracranial hypertension but every patient does not require too much of sedation just the control of analgesia is good enough in these patients if you do over sedation patient does not cooperate does not cough much and there is a lack of control and it leads to weakness ventilator associated pneumonia and other very important thing is if a patient is over sedated and immobilized it leads to critical illness neuropathy one of the most avoidable preventable factor for critical illness neuropathy is mobilization if you, because rest of the factors you may not have control like <clears throat> sepsis multi organ failure aminoglycosides neuromuscular steroid which you may have to give but this is avoidable factor if patient can be mobilized must be mobilized because if you mobilize it will prevent the ic acquired weakness which increases the patient on ventilation <coughs> and anxiety as well so an awake patient free of pain and anxiety is the best patient even on ventilator so unnecessarily sedation is harmful for critically ill patients and one of the recent study published in 2020 may one is a non sida study showed that the patient who remained sedated for agitation or respiratory failure had worse outcome including mechanically ventilatory and icu days and benzodiazepines as sedative agents are associated with the worse outcome because they are also the risk factor for delirium and what is now suggested is that you should once your patient is stabilized stop continuous infusion try that if you feel patient is the basic condition is better give intermittent infusion and now it is more of a protocolized goal directed rather than daily interruption now everybody is that what is my target and just maintain that target in that patient and always whenever you are giving sedative early conversion to short acting sedative like propofol so that you can easily wean that also off and just give analgesia to these patients the third very common error which we do is we use too much of antibiotics you know this is colef has of course shown in 2021 that early treatment with antibiotic within less than 1 hour has been associated with better outcome but there are patients without confirmed or infections they are just given antibiotic patient on ventilator antibiotic it is really not required you need to improve your infection control practices rather than give antibiotic to these unjustified antibiotic prescription contribute to of course resistance and it will lead eventually to the multi resistant pathogens which is a which is prevalent in most of the icus in our country and of course they do lead to clostridium difficile infections arrhythmia seizure every drug has some side effects which you uh, bring back and and always you should do a culture 
from whichever source of infection you think so that you can readjust and antibiotic stewardship should be there in your hospital to curtail the use of antibiotics. Even in COVID, I think all of you must have treated COVID. People were just being given antibiotics, which even recovery trials showed that the azithromycin, ivermectin, cephalosporins, without evidence of benefit, all these have been. And overall impact of this therapeutic misconduct, which we have done to these patients, really needs to, still is not characterized. So we should use appropriately only when the, you think there is infection and prophylactic antibiotics should not be used in the IC. Then the another overused is a prophylaxis of GI ulcer. Any patients in the ICU, pentos, pentaprazole or the H2 blocker is a norm. It's being given to a lot of patients. You know, you should remember that acid is a barrier to external pathogens. And your stomach does not get colonized with the pathogens. And when you give PPI, you suppress the acid and it leads to the growth of the organism, colonization with the organism, and which can result in a ventilator-associated pneumonia. And PPI also causes the alteration in the leukocyte function, phagocytosis, and acidification of lytic phagolysosome, which are again defensive mechanism. And of course, uh, VAP, as I said, and uh, they have seen that it does not lead to the reduction in mortality. And when you give enteral nutrition early, itself may be associated with decreased risk of GI ulcers. So unless a patient has a high risk of bleeding, has a high risk, or there is a bleeding, PPI as a routine should be avoided in the ICUs, which is a very common practice. Then the other is inappropriate blood transfusions. It's another common error. Of course, when patient is in hemorrhagic shock, severe anemia and coagulopathy, we give it. And unnecessarily administration, a lot of studies have shown that it leads to increased length of hospital stay, trolley, taco, increased cost and higher mortality. You know, if a person you give blood, it immunomodulates and that predisposes patient to nosocomial infections. You may have made the hemoglobin normal or INR normal in a non-bleeding patient, but it really does not help that patient in the outcome. And it is, there is always a, it leads to the irrational use. And uh, currently it is said that the, if you just maintain seven to eight, that is good enough without active or massive bleeding, there is no need to give blood to these individuals because some way they are causing harm in these patients. And, you know, uh, this is a ITEC trial 2020. It has said that if you give too much of blood using the viscoelastic test like the TEG and others, and this has also not shown to be better when compared to conventional coagulation test. So, so what I'm trying to say is that we should give the blood only if it is necessary. You know, if INR is six non-bleeding patient, there is no need patient that you need to uh, give FFPs to these individuals. Because it is, and there are even guidelines, sepsis guideline also says that don't give, just to correct the numbers if a patient is non-bleeding or there is a risk of bleeding. Then laboratory test, we really misuse. Every day morning, CBC, KFT, LFT, you know, because uh, it should be justified. And you should have a practice that every day evening that what test will be sent. X-ray every day, why the X-ray every day? And uh, similarly, the blood test every day. And a lot of blood, many a time sisters takes a lot of blood in, in the adult bottles. And uh, it, the, the, there are studies to show that it can lead to drop in the hemoglobin up to, even people have drop in hemoglobin up to one gram. And you think why a patient is losing, the hemoglobin is coming low because there are a lot of blood tests, repeatedly blood test. Somebody comes and says blood culture, the other says now send the KFT and sister sends a good amount of blood. So you should avoid and only, you should have a plan in the ICU that what test would be required. Of course it entails in a private sector cost also. Uh, 
So you should be very careful. Then invasive monitoring. Is it really required? You should, every patient, you should think whether an invasive monitoring, if not required, should be out. Because it, it is also associated with uh, bad outcomes. Swan Gans has, of course, been out of the ICU, still practiced in the, uh, in the OT. Similarly, transpulmonary thermodilution, or a PICO, which is now the upcoming, of course, it has a use in the operating room, in the liver transplant, or the management of complex patient. But routinely in the ICU, there is a study published last year. They have shown that if you do a hemodynamic management, it has not shown to reduce mortality. It might improve your hemodynamics at that time, but an improved perfusion, but it has not been shown. And there are complication reported, thrombosis and others because of the prolonged uh, installation of these modalities. So you should be very careful if they are required, only then you should use these modalities. Then patients are not fed or overfed. Patient with circulatory shock, of course you should because to avoid intestinal ischemia and uh, while uh, their macro and micro hemodynamic status improves, you can do that. But prolonged fasting and hospital malnutrition should be avoided and they have shown that it is associated with poorer outcome and higher mortality. So if patient cannot tolerate, at least give a trophic diet, trophic, uh, diet like about 500 ml of, uh, in 24 hours, and then build it up over three to seven days to his normal calorie requirement, which is about 20 to 30 ml per kg per day. And there is no need to start the internal nutrition as a full dose uh, to reduce mortality, but you should see what patient tolerates and, and avoid hyperglycemia and the other uh, modalities. So you should be very careful not to overfeed or underfeed. Protein in intake, you know, uh, low protein intake is associated with higher rates of infection and mortality. So you should give about 0.8 to 1.2. But intake more than 1.2, this patient is edematous, just give too much of protein and has not been shown to improve outcomes. So you should not, about 1.2 gram is good enough protein for these individuals. Then over treatment, like performing intervention that are not desired. A patient who's got multiple metastases and he is vasopressor, repeated admissions, is being given chemotherapy, he's being given the sedation, neuromuscular blockade, fluid therapy, vasopressors, blood products, all these things are being done, costing too much because the family wants, we do not communicate with them. We should try and avoid, we should be confident discussing with the relatives because it's easier, just continue whatever, 88 year old terminal patient, we are continuing everything. So we should try and avoid because by little bit spending time with the relatives, what I have seen is almost 95% of the relatives you are able to tell them and you de-escalate your treatment. Because, because patient can afford and because he's a rich man, you should not continue, you should try and, and frequent in other patient, frequent evaluate the therapeutic goals. High quality multidisciplinary management, minimize the treatment cost, you know, multidisciplinary cooperation, talking to each other can avoid the overtreatment. Then the other thing which we, common error, we don't, we don't mobilize. Because patient is on a ventilator, for last 15 years we have been mobilizing almost every patient on a ventilator. Who is on a more than 48 hours, he is always mobilized before he is extubated. Because, and we have seen that the Cases who suffer from critical nurse neuropathy has really gone down in our hospital. And uh, of course, it can lead to venous embolism, ulcers, myopathies, and critical neuropathy puts patient on a ventilator for a long time. Weaning becomes a problem. So just mobilizing, and once you set up system, your the housekeeping staff and others, how to mobilize, 
then they know and then you just have to order and they mobilize and rehabilitation improves the muscle strength patient ind independence and of course the complication and this is the kind of we have patients on a ventilator we mobilize them and when you can mobilize what we've devised is a move that is patient who is a myocardial stable who's got a good oxygenation fio2 less than 0.5 he's off vasopressor or a very low dose five mics of norad can be engaged to respond like you talk he's responding you can't overly sedated person mobilize so if move is satisfied you should mobilize your patient and then the other i'll talk about 2 3 minutes about the medication error which is very very common and i think all of us have seen in some form or the other it is a preventable event that may cause or lead to inappropriate medication use or patient harm while the medication is in the control of healthcare professional patient or consumer this is the definition given by the uh, ncc merp medication errors can occur at any prescription transcription preparing dispensing administration of drugs and 1.7 medical error occur each day and 78% of the errors in the icu medication error medical errors are in the medication errors and in us also the 4 lakh people die every year because of the medication errors so our countries may, may be much more and they occur more frequently in the emergency room operation theater icus and all places and there are spectrum of errors in current prescription spelling handwriting wrong abbreviation lack of daily drug chart review because once a drug is written we don't see and this drug is ongoing for many wrong labeling inaccurate dosing frequency or route of administration wrong combination of drugs so medication error can occur Uh, at any of these places there are re various risk it could be patient related patient is very severe you end up you call 10 physicians 10 specialist everyone comes and without discussing with each other writes down sometime it is a similar drug if you review you must have seen that the person doesn't see the what the others have written many a times and just write down his department and there is an over duplication of these drugs so these are also a uh, few of the common mistakes which we do most of the medical errors are preventable i mean they are not you some of these will occur but you can reduce them as far as possible and there are various things which have been suggested implementing computerized physician order clinical decision support system conducting independent double checks using computerized drug dosing barcode medication administration all these things are not possible but one thing which has made difference is just looking at the chart as an intensivist when you take a, all the drugs every day you know that i th i have seen why this is going every time you see you cut five six drugs which are really going in that patient and the other thing which has made difference in our hospital is the clinical pharmacist because they come and they see and they tell us many times you are giving wrong dose or you you are giving these two drugs they interact so clinical pharmacist now is a necessity in uh, in the coming years to look at the prescription when they are there then uh, other things because the lack of time i'll not discuss the only thing which i want to say is that the there are errors you would there would still be errors you can reduce it by increasing your knowledge and be little responsive and evidence based then probably you are right whatever you can do maximum to improve the patient outcome thank you very much thank you dr rajesh chawla for making this topic so interesting and making us realize that over treatment is equally bad you know we all always look at what we are not doing but overdoing also has a adverse outcome on patient's uh, recovery so sir we'll have the questions at the end of the session okay. Okay. any any question uh, we can have two question for dr chawla because he has to go and then we'll start with the next lecture thank you yeah any questions
Ma'am, uh, just one minute because sir has to leave, so uh, a memento presentation to the sir. So in sure. just, yeah, uh, may I request Pooja to please hand over the memento, please. Sir, please come. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good morning, family. I am thankful to uh, Anil sir, Hital, and all Vinit sir, and all who have given me this opportunity to talk. So the topic is approach to wide complex tachycardia in emergency and ICU. Now, the cruel reality of ICU is that at any given time we are as close to harming the patient as to treat this patient. And probably nowhere it is more applicable than treating patient with broad complex tachycardia. In a way, hernia represents the essence of emergency care, where if you make correct diagnosis, usually you would get good outcomes. But if you make wrong diagnosis, the result may be catastrophic. So first things first, if a patient is unstable, coming with broad complex tachycardia, that you need not follow anything else. If a patient is hemodynamically unstable, patient is having chest pain, on ongoing ischemia or heart failure with a broad complex tachycardia, which is regular, then give synchronized shock followed by amedron. Then definition of broad complex tachycardia is a rhythm with a rate more than 120 per minute and the QRS duration of more than 120 millisecond. If it is last for more than 30 seconds, it is sustained ventricular tachycardia. If it terminates within 30 seconds, it is called uh, non-sustained tachycardia. So, when you deal with a broad complex tachycardia, uh, you try to figure out whether it is a regular or irregular broad complex tachycardia. Regular broad complex tachycardia can be having sinus rhythm with a bundle branch block, ventricular tachycardia or SVT with bundle branch block. So first I will discuss with regular broad complex tachycardia and then we will discuss irregular broad complex tachycardia. So sinus tachycardia with bundle branch block very easy. All broad complex QRS will be preceded by a P wave. So it's very easy to define whether it's a sinus tachycardia with bundle branch block. Ventricular tachycardia, the hallmark of ventricular tachycardia is that there are two uh, sources of rhythm generation. One from the atrium and one from the ventricle. So many times you will get AV dissociation where you will get in between P waves. However, there are times when you may not get P waves because they will be hidden in the uh, QRS complexes. But remember, presence of AV dissociation is hallmark of uh, ventricular tachycardia. Then one more in TTI I want, uh, sorry, one more in TTI I want to discuss is SVT with emergency. I just believe that you will do a great service to emergency care if you forget that this diagnosis actually exists because you will save more lives. Whenever you are dealing with a broad complex tachycardia which is regular and you are confused whether it is VT or SVT with bundle branch block, treat it as ventricular tachycardia. Why it is so? Because if you presume it to be a case of ventricular tachycardia and it turns out to be SVT, the treatment still remains. But if you take it, if you presume it to be a case of SVT with bundle branch block and it turns out to be VT, you may kill the patient. No matter how smart you are, more smart people have killed patients because they thought too much. Cardiologists have come with all sort of algorithms and morphologies, none of them are foolproof. So when I discuss things with my junior regarding broad complex tachycardia and emergency, I tell them take it as VT, VT and VT alone. So 
so this is about the regular broad complex tachycardia irregular broad complex tachycardia i will discuss along with the ecgs so the physiological basis of tachyarrhythmias are enhanced automaticity triggered automaticity and reentry so straight away let's jump to the ecgs what you are seeing here is that this v1 to v6 leads and all of them are having negative qrs so this is a case of negative concordance concordance means the the qrs complexes are of similar morphology so from v1 to v6 all leads are having negative qrs complex so negative qrs complex broad complex tachycardia it is nothing but ventricular tachycardia again you are seeing here this is a negative qrs complex the uh, uh, all the qrs complexes are negative here so negative concordance if you are smart enough you will realize that there is a notch here in lead 3 at the nadir of the s wave what it is so if you are seeing a nadir a uh, notch near the nadir of the s wave in a case of broad complex this is ventricular tachycardia this is called as josephson sign which is very typical of ventricular tachycardia also if you are getting rs wave rs interval which is more than 100 millisecond now this the increase in interval is because the origin of the ventricular tachycardia is from myocyte so it takes some time for the myocyte 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 till reaches the conducting system so more broader the rs interval more is the chance of ventricular tachycardia but there is a catch i will discuss with that later on so we have discussed if there is negative concordance if there is a notching of s wave if there is rs interval more than 100 millisecond you think of in terms of ventricular tachycardia what you are seeing here is that these are negative complex qrs but this morphology of qrs is very different from these this is a case of fusion beat fusion beat is basically fusion of the atrial and the ventricular beat occurring together if you are even more if you are even more smart you will realize these two qrs complexes are near normal qrs complex so these are capture beats so that is in between the ventricular uh, rhythm you have atrial rhythm coming and and producing this normal ecg and more smart guys will see that here you are getting a q wave here you are getting a inverted t wave so probably this patient is having old ischemia which has resulted in this kind of ventricular tachycardia so we have discussed negative concordance we have discussed rs interval we have discussed fusion beats and capture beats the fourth point to uh, to uh, to put our stamp on ventricular tachycardia is that these patients will have atypical bundle branch block morphology see if a patient is having bundle branch and he is following the normal conduction then the patient will have normal bundle branch but suppose if the origin is from the ventricle somewhere here so from here the patient will start depodization so the patient's uh, bundle branch morphology will not be normal i will come with example so look at look at this ecg so what you are seeing here is that though v1 the rbbb looks normal type because the first r wave is smaller the r dash is taller but if you look at lead v6 usually you do not get this kind of d waves in v6 in patient with rbbb so this is a case of a typical bundle branch block pattern if you are more smart you will see the avr leads are positive so if the avr is positive that means the pulse, the impulse is generating and going in this direction so if it is going in this direction that means the origin is somewhere near the ventricle apex part so presence of a indeterminate axis or northward axis or a strange axis is also in favor of ventricular tachycardia so what you are seeing here is a atypical rbbb pattern what you call the rabbit sign where in normal rbbb the first r wave is small here you are seeing the first r wave the tip is bigger the second r dash is smaller so this is called as rabbit sign again this is a case of atypical bundle branch block see what i am saying is you may not remember typical or atypical bundle branch block if you are again confused it's a case of broad complex tachycardia treat it as ventricular tachycardia but for the sake of discussion i am trying to find, uh, tell you that these are the findings based on which you can 100% say that it is a case of broad complex tachycardia
Now, this is a strange case. This is a 15 year old boy who had history of palpitation and came for evaluation and cardiologist did this stress, uh, stress test and this was the rhythm of 10. Here you are seeing that this is a typical left bundle branch. The, look at lead V1 and lead V6. This is typical left bundle branch pattern. Also you are seeing that from V1, V2, V3, the polarity has changed from negative to positive. So this is not a case of uh, concordance. There is no concordance here and the RB, uh, this is a typical LVBB pattern. But in a young patient, in presence of change of polarity from near about V3 and <coughs> You see, lead one is negative. So, in presence of change of polarity in a regular broad complex tachycardia with right axis deviation, you think of right ventricular outflow tract arrhythmias. So, again I am saying that take all broad complex tachycardias as ventricular tachycardia because you will not make any error. Even though you are not getting concordance, you are getting typical left bundle branch block pattern. For the sake of discussion, only for the sake of discussion, I am posting this ECG that this patient, if you look at lead V2, here you are seeing one P wave, this is another P wave, this is one P wave, this is P wave and the heart rate is 150. Dilip, you remember that case? Right, Rat ke do baje, apne bula sa ki agar ye atter fetter nahi hua to naam badal dunga. So, so, so if a heart rate is around 150 and you are seeing P waves more than that of QRS, then you think in terms of SV. This is a case of basically atrial flutter with bundle branch block. But to say that it is SVT with bundle branch block, ideally you should have a previous ECG and all the QRS, say lead one smorphology, should be similar to that of the lead one smorphology which was done in the earlier part. So all the QRS complexes should have similar morphology compared to the previous ECG. And then only you think in terms of SVT with bundle branch block. This I am saying again, this is for the sake of completion. You should not consider this in emergency when patient comes to you for the first time. Now another case, this is not VT, this is a case of antidromic AVRT. But you cannot, this is one of the limitation of ECG. By ECG you cannot differentiate between antidromic AVRT and VT. You shock the patient, patient goes back to normal rhythm, there you find features of pre-excitation, that is you get a short PR interval, you may get a delta wave and based on that you diagnose that this is a case of antidromic AVRT. What drug will you give in this patient? Wrong drug will kill this patient in one minute. If you think of giving amidron or lignocaine, patient will have clean kill. One of the limitation of ACLS is that they are basically for patients who take two packet of cigarette every day, who comes with a chest pain and collapses. ACLS guideline is not for toxins and electrolyte imbalance. This is a case of this electrolyte. This is a case of hyperkalemia. In this patient, if you give amidron, you will kill the patient on spot. The treatment is <coughs> the treatment is calcium and insulin. So how will you differentiate that this is a, not a case of ventricular tachycardia and this because of uh, electrolyte imbalances or sometimes TCA toxicity. Here, the QRS complexes will be really wide, more than one big square. So when you see this kind of bizarre ECG, you should always look for history of, of, of toxin or, or uh, features of hyperkalemia and you can quickly do a ABG to find out whether potassium is very high. So this is one ECG you should remember. If you are getting a bizarre ECG with the QRS complex more than one big square, Think of <coughs> electrolyte imbalance and toxins. Now, we know that AV node has a decremental conduction and AV delay, which is a very, very important protective mechanism. However, in presence of accessory pathway, what happens is that if the patient is having atrial fibrillation, most of these impulses will be bypassing through the AV node and going through the accessory pathway into the ventricle. And if the patient is having atrial fibrillation with high rate, then these patients will develop almost a malignant ventricular rate of around 300 per minute. So this is what you are seeing, that some of the RR interval is less than one small square. So at times the rate goes to around 300. If you are seeing a patient with irregular heart rate and the heart rate is reaching around 300 and one more thing, that the QRS complexes morphologies are changing. 
So look at this. This QRS complex is very different from this QRS complex. This QRS complex is very different from this QRS complexes. But the axis is not changing. If this is positive, then all of them are positive. So if you are seeing this kind of ECG, this is a case of pre-excited AF. If you give adenosine, beta blocker, calcium channel blocker, or digoxin, or amidron, you will kill this patient. You shock these patients, then put this patient on flicanide or procanamide. So this is second point I want you to as take home message. First one is all broad complex, regular tachycardia should be considered ventricular tachycardia unless put otherwise. The second is recognize this pattern. Irregular heart rate, very high heart rate, presenting with broad complex like this with morphologies, not similar but axis not changing. This is a case of <coughs> pre-excited F. This is a simple case of uh, atrial fibrillation with bundle branch block. Here what you are seeing is that the oh, sorry. Here you are seeing is that the morphology is same. Though the heart rate is irregular, but morphology is absolutely same. So then it is a case of simple atrial fibrillation with bundle branch block. And rate will never be 300 because anyway it is going through the AV node which has a decremental conduction. Now, yeah, this is my second last slide. Uh, so here you are seeing, you can appreciate that the QT is prolonged. And this is the T wave. And on the T wave, there is a ectopic. And this ectopic has resulted in this kind of rhythm. So what you are seeing here is a polymorphic pattern. And the QRS axis is changing from positive to negative. You can see this is positive, this is, and here it is become negative. Negative, negative, again it is positive. So if the axis is changing from negative to positive or positive to negative on a regular basis, think in terms of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Now, how will you differentiate polymorphic ventricular tachycardia from torsets deep pointers? You cannot. For that to take place, you have to bring the patient back to sinus rhythm and then see whether the QT interval is prolonged or not. If the QT interval is prolonged, then it is a case of torsets deep pointers. So, so I have kept these two slides. You remember the first one is that the QRS morphologies are different, but the axis is not changing. All of them are negative QRSs. But here, you are seeing that axis is also changing. So, suppose this is positive, this is negative. This is positive, here you are seeing negative QRS complexes. So, if the axis is changing from positive to negative, it is a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. If it is axis is not changing, then it is a case of pre-excited AF. Now, uh, VT is always wide complex rhythm. Is it so? No. It depends on from where the, the origin of the ventricular tachycardia rhythm is. If it is far from the conducting system, you will have a broader QRS complex. If it is very near to the uh, QRS complex, then you may get not that broad complex. So that has to be remembered. VT is always associated with change in axis. No. Again, if it is near to the conducting system, you get a normal morphology. VT is always associated with different morphology. Again, it all depends where the origin of the uh, ventricular tachycardia is. If the origin is near to the conducting system, then looks uh, the ECG looks very normal. At times, it is very difficult. My last point is that overconfidence is a very serious problem. If you don't think it affects you, that's probably because you are overconfident. So take it ECG seriously. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kumar, for this excellent and the one message which you have given is if you are not sure about uh, what rhythm is it treat all broad complex tachycardia as ventricular tachycardia because otherwise it can have a uh, life saving uh, effect so i think we'll have questions after the session if it's okay with you yes, yes yeah. thank you very much we can have questions after the session so our next speaker is dr vibhu parashar he is a owner of emma nursing home critical care expert Licensing with Cloud Physician Group, running his own ICU from Motihari. Uh, Dr. Vibhu is going to talk on management of critically ill pregnant patient, a very important different subset of patients which we have to understand when we are managing them. 
हेलो गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन एंड आई वुड लाइक टू थैंक अनिल सर विनीत सर फॉर गिविंग मी दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी टू स्पीक बिफोर यू स्टार्टिंग विथ मैनेजमेंट ऑफ क्रिटिकल एल प्रेग्नेंट पेशेंट मैटरनल क्रिटिकल केयर इज वन ऑफ द मोस्ट इग्नोर्ड टॉपिक इन आई सी एंड द मैनेजमेंट इज बिलीव्ड टू बी द सेम एज डिलिंग विथ अदर क्रिटिकल केयर केसेज बट इट इज नॉट बिकॉज हियर वी आर डीलिंग विथ टू लाइफ and the unique maternal physiological adaptations pose an impact in their management the most common cause of maternal death and indication for admission in icu in india is obstetric hemorrhage followed by sepsis hypertensive disease abortion indirect causes and other causes related to pregnancy and its condition so the indication of admission of critically ill pregnant patient in icu can be pregnancy specific that is due to preeclampsia amniotic fluid embolism help syndrome acute fatty liver obstetric sepsis due to chorioaminitis or hemorrhage or it can be aggravated by pregnancy like increased risk of gastric acid aspiration venous thromboembolism pyelonephritis and worsening of other pre-existing conditions along with some non-specific causes that can be trauma non-obstetric infections chronic respiratory failures so the management requires application of basic intensive care principles with modification based on the physiological changes associated with pregnancy so the management can be pregnancy um, related to the management of pregnancy specific condition and also the presence of fetus is considered while managing these patients some basic changes during pregnancy that happens in a body is uh, the changes associated with airway there is increased airway edema making the airway more fragile which can lead to trauma hemorrhage hypoxia and arrest in these pregnant pregnant patients the enlarged gravity uterus poses uh, increases the intra abdominal pressure leading to the decreased in functional residual capacity and in the respiratory system usually these pregnant patients have increased respiratory rate increased minute ventilation with reduced functional residual capacity which further leads them for very rapid deterioration during intubation and make them more prone to hypoxia due to poor reservoir the blood gases in pregnant patients are usually alkalotic the ph is usually alkalotic as they have uh, increased minute ventilation so uh, the P pso2 is usually on the lower side somewhere around 30 and our goal should always be there to uh, prevent further hyperventilation uh, because the alkalosis will further worsen the fetal uh, blood circulation and make them prone for hypoxic injury the cardiovascular changes that happens in uh, pregnancy is the increased blood volume which leads to dilution anemia decrease in oxygen carrying capacity and uh, increased physiological reserve which will significant which will uh, further lead to significant blood loss may occur before the onset of symptoms in these patients the increased cardiac output and heart rate by 40 to 50% which will prevent the early diagnosis of hypovolemia Uh, more difficult and these patient will have less effective cpr as already the demand is very much high in these patients the bp is usually on the lower side so there is a very decreased physical uh, physiological reservoir the gravid uterus uh, accounts for 10% of the cardiac output so they may be a very potential source for massive hemorrhage heart is usually rotated cephalad and leftward and there is also a increased chamber size making them prone for arrhythmias PLI measurements uh, the data accumulated from PLI measurements have shown that the they have a 20 to 30% of decrease in systemic vascular resistance and pulmonary vascular resistance with an increase in cardiac output by 20 to 50%. So we have some impact of maternal uh, hypoxia on fetus also. So the risk of fetus during ICU stays always there and it can be due to fetal hypoxia the radiological investigation that is performed in ICU and it may be due to drug therapy that is used. so fetal oxygenation is further dependent on placental function uterine oxygen delivery which is further dependent on maternal oxygen content and uterine blood flow which can further be affected by uh, release of catecholamines due to various stimuli worsening of alkalosis hypotension or uterine contractions the radiological procedures in icu are performed in on regular basis but these poses some risks like making them prone from for oncogenicity teratogenicity and some neurodevelopmental defects but acog recommends a upper limit of safety of 5 rads 
for any radiological investigation performed and the routine investigation which we do in ICUs are definitely below the permissible limit. So uh, routine investigation which are necessary in ICU like chest x-ray can be performed if uh, indicated. The only thing that we need to consider is to avoid <coughs> daily unnecessary chest x-rays for monitoring these patients but we should not avoid necessary investigations like if you are suspecting a pulmonary embolism and we need to do a CTPA we should go for it if patient is unstable and contrast also poses some risk to the fetus as well as mother but perf during performing the radiological procedures we should always use a abdominal sc sc uh, screen so that it may reduce the exposure by 50% but still the internal scattering will happen in these patients. The drug therapy is also altered because of increased plasma volume, increase in cardiac output, altered hepatic protein synthesis which will further alter the drug binding and clearance due to increased volume of distribution. All the anotropic drugs that is used in pregnancy affect the placental perfusion. They usually reduce the placental perfusion. So the first thing to do in managing these hemodynamically unstable patients should always be uh, fluid if hemodynamic permits and uh, the routine drugs dopamine, dobutamine have a very well effect on uterine blood flow. Preferred drug is uh, phenyl use of phenylephrine and ephedrine in pregnancy. There is always a risk to the uh, fetus while in ICU stay. So there is a 65% chances of spontaneous abortion during the first trimester and the risk factor for the fetal loss can be due to maternal shock, lower gestational age and maternal transfusion. Coming to the individual uh, complication that lead these patients that bring these patients to ICU one of the complication is the help syndrome and it can be a complication of preeclampsia or eclampsia maybe a variant of severe preeclampsia so it is uh, diagnosed by the presence of hemolysis which is further evident by the presence of uh, cystocytes or birth cells on peripheral smear increased bilirubin increased LDH supported by elevated liver enzymes of increased AST of more than 70 a LDH of more than 600 and thrombocytopenia of less than 1, one lakh. But it can also happen in uh, some subsets of patient uh, without hypertension and proteinuria also. The differential diagnosis of HELP syndrome has uh, can be uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenic papyrrha, HUS, acute fatty liver of pregnancy, SLE because they have a very much overlapping presentation among each other. The onset can be antepartum, usually develops before 37 weeks and postpartum mostly within 48 hours and it happens in 90% of those patients who are preeclamptic in antepartum period. They have some complication related to the hepatic system leading to intrahepatic hemorrhage, coagulopathy leading to DIC in 38% of the patient, hemolysis, hemolysis which is evident by the presence of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, renal failure, ARDS. They can be classified based on Mississippi class 3 system or Tennessee system which has classified HELP syndrome into class 1, 2 and 3 based on the uh, values of platelet count and in Tennessee system it can be complete syndrome or incomplete. Complete when the AST and ALT is more than 40, platelets less than 1 lakh, LDH more than 600, AST more than 70 or incomplete when any or one or two of the above are present. The management of HELP syndrome is ultimately delivery but it, it is also dependent on the gestational age of the uh, fetus. So if it is less than 34 weeks, steroid is indicated for fetal lung maturity and if the condition permits, patient is hemodynamically stable, we can wait uh, in a tertiary care hospital with a good neonatal ICU facility and if the condition deteriorates, we can directly go for delivery. And if it is more than 34 weeks, the delivery is only the option. Some specific therapy in health syndrome associated with liver injury like if there is a liver, we suspect a liver hematoma, we can go for a CT scan or right upper quadrant ultrasound and if it shows an unruptured hematoma, the management goes with a conservative approach with administration of platelets, fresh frozen plasma, close observation monitoring for abdominal compartment syndrome, serial imaging or CT should be performed and if there is uh, evidence of increase in the size of the hematoma or maternal decompos uh, decompensation is there we should directly go for emergency laparotomy. But if the uh, scan shows the ruptured hematoma, then resuscitative measures along with correction of the coagulopathy with blood and blood products with monitoring of abdominal compartment syndrome should be done. Emergency laparotomy should be done in case of worsening of maternal uh, hemodynamics, development of ab abdominal compartment syndrome or if there is a continued 
transfusion requirement. Further followed by surgical interventions by evacuation of hematoma, packing, suturing. Along with that, the uh, resuscitative measures should be continued and one uh, plasma exchange can be tried in these patients who are not responding to surgical management also. If the patient stabilizes, bleeding stops, delivery is the next option. But if bleeding persists despite routine measures, then consideration for total hepatectomy and tempor temporary portocable shunt should be considered. Ultimately, liver transplant is the option in these patients. In HEP syndrome, the use of steroids doesn't decrease the maternal mortality, but it definitely helps in improving the platelet count and bringing down the LDH and ALT level and reduces the hospital and ICU stay. HEP syndrome, TTP and HUS. They share a very common pathophysiological mechanism of endothelial injury and thrombotic throm uh, microangiopathy. So differentiating TTP, HUS and HELP syndrome is very important and HELP syndrome usually occurs around 37 weeks of gestation while TTP in mid trimester and HUS is usually in postpartum period. HUS carries a tetrad of symptoms that is a thrombotic microangiopathic anemia along with uh, acute kidney injury, thrombocytopenia and TTP is added with fever and neurological complication. These two differentiate TTP from HUS along with TTP has a low admits 13 activity and the von Willebrand factor is uh, von Willebrand factor macromeres are more in TTP as compared to HUS. In HELP syndrome, these patients have more of the liver related symptoms like they are uh, have more, more profound jaundice, more profound elevation in transaminase level. So if we consider patients uh, with HELP syndrome or TTP when the diagnosis is in dilemma and the clinical and laboratory features are common to both HELP and TTP and if the uh, patient is associated with preeclampsia then the consideration towards HELP syndrome is more and we go directly for delivery with fetal and maternal monitoring and along with uh, features of TTP and HELP if um, there is a evidence of multiple organ failure and extreme of lab values then there is a high likelihood of TTP. We can directly go for plasma exchange followed by uh, steroids and uh, rituximab. But if the diagnosis is not determi uh, determi uh, determined, we can directly go for uh, delivery and one session of plasma exchange. And if there is a good response from plasma exchange, TTP should be considered followed by the therapy for TTP. Along with if the admit 13 count is less than 10%, then it suggests towards TTP. And if it is more than 10%, it is suggested towards health syndrome. So the primary, uh, the goal, uh, the main information here is in TTP, the primary treatment is plasma exchange followed by rituximab, but in HUS, in the HELP syndrome, it is the delivery. In postpartum period, the confusion can occur with HUS. So the basic thing is to uh, identify the admit 13 level. Admit 13 level is more than 10%. It is more towards HUS or HELP. And if it is less than 10%, it is more towards TTP. In TTP, the main treatment is plasma exchange followed by rituximab, but in HUS, it is eclusimab followed by plasma exchange. Coming to acute fatty liver of pregnancy, there is a uh, problem with fatty acid oxidation and medium chain uh, fatty acids along with long chain fatty acid metabolites enter the maternal circulation and cause the apoptosis of hepatocytes. The main presentation in acute fatty liver of pregnancy is uh, present presence of hypoglycemia, hyperammonemia, renal dysfunction, coagulopathy, encephalopathy. These are more suggestive towards acute fatty liver of pregnancy. And hypoglycemia will be more evident in patient with acute fatty liver of pregnancy as compared to HELP, TTP or HUS. There is a Swansea criteria for diagnosis of acute fatty liver uh, in which six of these should be present. And the management is really supportive and there is no any specific therapy but plasma pheresis can be given a trial ultimately liver transplant is the option if the patient deteriorates intrahepatic cholestasis uh, has a good maternal prognosis and they usually present with pruritus elevated bile salts or serum transaminase level and there is uh, usually itching in the soles or feet and mostly worse at night coming to amniotic fluid embolism it has a very catastrophic uh, complication and carries a mortality of 10 to 85 percent and usually present with cardiovascular collapse and hemodynamic collapse. It carries a biphasic model of presentation uh, 
and usually in the first phase the amniotic fluid enters the maternal circulation activates the biochemical mediators leading to pulmonary vasoconstriction leading to increased right heart uh, pressure leading to failure and followed by left heart failure with acute respiratory distress syndrome followed by these mediators activates the clotting cascade leading to dic hemorrhage and it is a very dreaded complication as it it is the only condition which can have all types of shock that is a uh, cardiogenic shock distributive shock obstructive shock and hemorrhagic shock early in the phase is a cardiogenic and obstructive shock followed by distributive shock and hemorrhagic shock the, there is no specific testing for amniotic fluid embolism other all the tests can be supportive but not diagnostic and it is usually a diagnosis of exclusion management is focused uh, on the manifestation of amniotic fluid embolism so we have to manage all the complication of amniotic fluid embolism starting from the airway cardiovascular support along uh, with uh, acls uh, protocol along with the peri perimortem cesarean delivery if the patient is not responding back along with hemostatic support with activation of obstetric hemorrhage protocol and massive transfusion protocol pulmonary embolism is other dreaded complication in uh, pregnancy landing up in icu so uh, the d dimer values are not useful but if compression ultrasonography is also normal then it can have a negative predictive value ctp and va scanning vq scanning should be done vq scanning has a higher accuracy with less maternal radiation ct angiography is safe for the fetus but it carries increased risk of breast cancer in pregnant patients so clinical indicators for imaging are shortness of breath pleuritic chest pain hypoxemia tachycardia and to lesser extent tachypnea the management of uh, suspected pulmonary embolism is based on the presence of dvt symptoms if they are present and a compression ultrasonography is positive and the echo shows normal ra rv uh, size then we can just go for direct anti therapeutic anticoagulation if the dvt symptoms are absent then the next step is to perform a radiological investigation is chest x ray in pregnancy which is not in other cases if the chest x ray is abnormal we go for ctpa if it is negative no need for treatment if it is positive go for therapeutic anticoagulation if chest x ray is normal then we can go for vq scanning if vq scanning is normal uh, is positive then we can go for directly therapeutic anticoagulation and if it is negative we can go for no treatment and conservative management if vq scan is non diagnostic then again we have to go for ctp so the only indication for thrombolysis in uh, pregnancy is the unstable hemodynamics that is uh, confirmed case of pulmonary embolism with ra rv dysfunction or evidence of myocardial injury we can directly go for thrombolysis and tissue plasmogen activator should be the drug of choice because it does not crosses the placenta iv unfractionated heparin is preferred in cases where the risk of bleeding is high there is a persistent hypotension or severe renal failure we should discontinue the subcutaneous formulation and switch to iv formulation before 24 to 36 36 hours of delivery and uh, uh, that it should be discontinued 4 to 6 hours prior to delivery and restart heparin after 12 hours of lscs and 6 hours after normal delivery and it should be continued at least 6 partum postpartum 6 uh, 6 weeks postpartum and duration should be minimum of 6 months warfarin is safe drug to use during this period some uh, very briefly about uh, some consideration during mechanical ventilation uh, it uh, the difficult airway is always there so it should be performed by exp experienced and expert person non invasive ventilation can only be as a bridge treatment because they always carries a high risk of aspiration the goal for oxygenation in pregnant patients should be always higher po2 of more than 70 at least ventilation goal should be uh, to avoid hypoventilation and avoid psu to below 25 because it will worsen the alkalemia and further decrease the utero placental circulation and fetal cause fetal hypoxia the respiratory system compliance is very much decreased so high peep is needed to overcome the increased transpulmonary pressure briefly about hemorrhage in pregnancy the hemorrhagic shock is managed in a similar way management of antepartum hemorrhage we can have a discussion in uh, question answer session about these if anything is there i will briefly come to asthma associated with pregnancy uh, it is approximately in one third of the pregnant patient will deteriorate one third will improve and one third will remain unchanged uh, 
the important thing to consider in asthma is again to avoid hypoventilation and to keep in mind the by for limiting the dynamic hyperinflation that occurs with conventional ventilation so the tidal volume should be limited in these patients the peak inspiratory flow rate should be kept high to so that we can have a early inspiratory time and prolonged expiratory time the respiratory rate should be on the lower side short acting beta agonists should be preferred because long acting have some major cardiac malformation complication and they can cause renal dysplasia also anti leukotrienes and inhaled corticosteroids are used prostaglandin should be avoided as it can worsen the bronchoconstriction and worsen asthma tocolytics should be used very cautiously in patients with uh, preterm labor because they may aggravate pulmonary edema also because they have a they can kick off the adrenergic mediated sympathetic tone and cause pulmonary edema cardiac arrest in pregnancy it is one in 12000 admissions for delivery and 58.9% survive to hospital discharge so during uh, modification of cpr during pregnancy few things need to be kept in mind the defibrillation is uh, same as in normal cpr high quality cpr should be there the only thing is uh, difference is that we should always keep these patients in left lateral position to avoid the aorto caval uh, compression that is happening placing an iv line above the diaphragmatic level because the gravity uterus will decrease the uh, drug delivery to the system and uh, correction of the reversible causes like a b c d e e f g h anesthetic complications bleeding cardiovascular complication drugs used in pregnancy embolic complications fever general non obstetric causes of cardiac arrest in pregnancy and hypertension and perimortem cesarean section should be performed within 5 minutes because literature have shown that uh, this was from the recent guideline initially it was 4 minutes now it's 5 minutes because the recent uh, it has been shown that if perimortem cesarean section is done before 5 uh, minutes of pregnancy the risk free period for mother and fetus increases can we please wind yes. up yes so this is a brief list about the liver and delivery equipment and infant supportive required equipment that has to be prepared in icu for managing all these critically ill pregnant patients thank you so you can have your <laughs> thank you very much dr vibhu i think we can have discussion in the tea time and we'll have some uh, time for the few questions also uh, really an excellent presentation it's a vast topic thank so you. i think whatever is left we can discuss later on uh, so our next speaker is Dr. Dilip Raman he is a founder of Cloud Physician Healthcare Company into Critical Care and Connected Care across India. He is based in Bangalore. He is going to talk on please. Hello, good morning to everyone. Uh, there is a very small announcement. Uh, TAS T-shirts are available at the registration counter at the cost of 800 rupees. Anybody who wants to have it. check their size there and get your t-shirts beside that there is a copy of shri mat mat bhagavad gita free of cost available uh, for the reading or or for taking with you whomsoever is interested in taking it with you it's available at the tea stall thank you all right good morning everyone thanks for being here uh, and and thanks to the organizing committee of uh, tascon for inviting me here and and allowing me to share some of my learnings with all of you uh, the topic that was given was uh, 
for me to address ventilator waveforms and loops. And the time given is about 20 minutes. And, and one of the key messages that, that I wanted to share with you is that um, ever so often since we started doing this, the common question that I get is, Doc, can you suggest one book or one source for information on how to read a ventilator waveform or how to analyze ventilator loops? And um, you know, a few years ago, it was very difficult for me to give one book because the information is scattered and the way in which people think about ventilators is always um, related to what they were used to in training, especially with regard to names or with regard to frameworks that they use based on whatever model was prevalent at that time. So I've been working with this group and, and some of my mentors and, and we've been trying to formulate a methodology of first classifying the ventilator modes. And this is something that we've been sharing in previous forums as well on how to break down a mode into what the mode actually does. And over that time, um, the same group, in fact, worked towards a model on how to analyze ventilator waveforms. And interestingly, uh, you know, this question kept coming, like, I need one source, I need one book, and there are many books. There's Paul Marino, you'll get a certain, certain way of dealing with it. You go to the anesthesia literature, Bill Beams, you'll get another workflow. You go to Tobin's, which is the Bible, you'll get a completely separate way of doing it. And today, I think this paper came out in September 2021, and I'm fairly confident in saying that if you are a trainee, or if you're an expert in, in uh, critical care and mechanical ventilation and you want to condense all of analysis of waveforms and loops in, in one uh, paper, or let's say even 16 sheets that you need to read, I think this is the closest we have come so far. So what I'm going to try and do in this talk is take these two papers as a framework, share it with you so that you can use it and you can practice it and, and see if this applies to your daily practice. So just like we had the ECG talk, you know, when we are learning ECGs over time, we are taught to look at the P wave, the QRS, um, the ST segment in a very stepwise fashion, rate, rhythm, pulse, look at the sheet. It's that same construct that has been applied to uh, ventilator waveforms. And I think that has matured quite a bit over the last 10, 15 years of uh, the work done by a few groups. And what I'm trying to do in the next 15 minutes is actually condense this methodology. So this methodology is, is really on this slide. If you have to remember one slide on how to break down a ventilator waveform, look at this one. And just immediately, if you want to discard something from your mind, uh, start to think as if you can ignore loops. Uh, the problem with loops is it was designed in an era where we analyzed paralyzed and passive patients. It was experimental. And in today's mechanically ventilated patients, hardly ever do you get that pristine environment. So Almost all the information that you need for analysis is there on your scalar waveform. So just focus on that. And we typically break it down into three. You want to tag the mode, and I'll tell you what that is. And again, it will come with practice. Don't assume that this is the only talk you need. That is not true. You will need the framework, and then just keep repeating the, the exercise every time. And I'll share how we do it in our group as well. After the tag, you talk about the load a little bit, the load in inspiration, the load in expiration. Then you talk about the patient ventilator relationship. So people call it asynchrony, synchrony, dyssynchrony. Basically, it's a relationship. It's a relationship like any relationship, like friendship or marriage. It's a relationship between the machine and it's doing something on its own clock. And then there's a relationship between the patient and the patient is doing something on his or her own clock in the mind, the neural time. Uh, and that relationship is broken down into four main segments, trigger, inspiration, cycle, and expression. That's it. All the complexity that you see in a ventilator can be broken down into these three segments. And, and when we are trying to explain this to trainees as well, we try to stay away from complex industry-led terminology and, and, and stratify it according to these standard goals. Then you take that entire analysis and the fourth step actually is to look at the diagram on, the, on your right-hand side, which is what are the goals of mechanical ventilation? Again, to simplify, there are only three goals. Oxygen, carbon dioxide, respiratory rate, willy, patient self-induced lung injury, all of that comes under safety. You want to optimize safety. If you are in ARDS, you're trying to focus on safety. If you're trying close uh, to, to get the patient close to liberation or extubation, that's a liberation goal. 
And if the patient is going to be on the ventilator for a long time, you actually want to optimize comfort. And at any given point in time in your journey, you're going to be balancing these three goals. And the mode you choose and the setting you choose and the drug you choose is going to define this. So if people say, how do I choose a mode? You use this framework. Safety, comfort and liberation. If your focus is comfort and liberation, you choose CPAP. You choose pressure support or you choose a mode that gets them off the ventilator. So we'll come to that. Um, talking about TAG, TAG is actually an acronym uh, which, which stands for the, the term taxonomic attribute grouping, uh, which is very simple in the way it's constructed. It takes some practice to get used to, but all it says is what the mode does. Think about it like uh, you have you know, 15 different types of paracetamol in the market, Dolo 650, Calpol, Fepenil, all of that. The tag is just the generic name, paracetamol. It tells you what it does. That's all. Now, to understand that, you'll have to practice this a little bit. The easier parts are the first two steps, figuring out what is the control variable, figuring out what is the breath sequence. Targeting scheme is a little bit more complex. It takes time. But as you practice, as you do this, over six months, you will definitely see some clarity of thought. And then as, as time progresses, as you keep doing this over and over again in your, in your time at the bedside, this, with this will come pretty naturally. And the advantage of doing this is that once you define a mode, no ventilator manufacturer will be able to trick you with any fancy names. No matter what trade names they throw, um, you will be able to analyze this in a very logical framework. So, Let's go through this pretty quickly. Some of this we'll cover quickly because we need to get to more um, refined things here. But control variables are only two, flow and, and pressure. Flow is the time integral of volume, so flow and volume are essentially the same if you add the time variable. Importantly, what you'll see is that as long as the fl flow waveform is flat on top, that is what the machine is controlling because the machine has a microprocessor that can control only one thing at one time. It can't control flow and pressure simultaneously. That is mathematically governed. And this is how you differentiate. If your pressure waveform is constant on the scalar, it's pressure control. If flow is constant, it's flow control. In the next step of the tag, you have the breath sequence. And the breath sequence is very clearly defined as what starts the breath and what stops the breath. If the patient is starting the breath and stopping the breath, only then is it defined as a spontaneous breath. Only then, no other situation. If the ventilator was triggered by the patient but the ventilator stopped the breath because of time or volume, it's a mandatory breath. Now, you can get combinations and ignore the complexity of the four types of intermittent ventilation. Just understand that in a single picture, if you see a spontaneous breath, and a mandatory breath, it is some form of IMV. That IMV can be um, an IMV type 1 where the intermittent breaths are mandatory and they are given regardless or they can be suppressed by the patient's spontaneous breath. So there are different types of IMV and, and, and I'm just laying the construct out. If you look at it, there are only five possible sequences and that is pressure control CMV, CSV and IMV and in volume control you cannot get CMV because by definition, that breath cannot be stopped by the patient. So CSV is not possible in volume control. With these five primary sequences, you can mix and match different targeting schemes. And again, this is where you need practice. This is where you look at a mode at bedside, analyze what is the targeting scheme, and then just like you were sharing a ECG story, you start from a beginner and then you end up as an enthusiast, as an expert, it takes time. But this framework and these two papers actually will go a long way if you keep practicing it. And what I'm going to share is actually how to practice it. That's what we'll come to. So there are different targeting schemes. The most common one that you would have used is set point, where you go set the inspiratory pressure, or you set the tidal volume, and the ventilator just follows your instructions. Uh, there are other complex targeting schemes, some of which you have used every day, such as PRVC is actually a form of adaptive targeting, where it is actually a pressure control mode, but you're setting a tidal volume. So the tidal volume is set by the operator, but it is different from the control variable. The control variable is pressure, and the pressure adapts to reach that secondary target that you've put, and that's why it's called adaptive. Modes like NAVA or PAV are something like power steering, which is your car is going to help you 
make the turn while you are making the turn. So in NAVA, the signal from the diaphragm is sensed by the ventilator and the ventilator says that the, that the patient needs more work done by the ventilator to help the patient breathe within that same breath, just like power steering. And that is a different form of targeting. So similarly, there are other forms like optimal and dual, which we can discuss later. And there are about seven different types. And, and this is the beauty of how the mode has been done. And this is about, this one slide reflects about 20 years of work. What they have done is they have looked at the patent. They've looked at the format of every mode in existence today in North America and Europe and broken them down into the tag. And each of this, we can actually discuss and decide how the tag was built, how it was made. And, and this has not been done in non-invasive vent, non ventilators as of now. That is still in process. But this sort of framework is what helps trainees and clinicians work with these diverse names. And the complexity is going to increase. I think there are about uh, 1,600 brand names of ventilator modes right now. Uh, doesn't make sense. You have to classify that. So that is, that is the point of, of doing all of this. So going to the second half of what we want to talk about is to look at the load. Now, how do you look at the load? First thing you need to analyze is that if there is a single equation you need to understand in ventilator uh, and patient interactions, it's the equation of motion. And in the equation of motion, even if you don't remember the formula, what you need to remember is that on one side you have the pressure. The pressure can be either patient pressure P mus or ventilator pressure, which is P vent. On the other side, you have dynamics of the patient, which is uh, flow, resistance, elastance. That's it. So this is why I said that a ventilator can only control one thing at a time. If you control the pressure on one side, everything on the other side becomes a dependent variable. If you're controlling flow, then all the things on the pressure side become dependent. So all the modes in ex existence today are using this, this formula. And the point about load is that if you increase the work done by the ventilator, typically the work done by the patient comes down. If the patient work increases, the ventilator work comes down. Sometimes you don't want that to happen. Sometimes you actually want the ventilator to do more work to minimize patient work. But the idea is this balance between the load. Now, the beauty is that, I mean, I didn't rec recognize this, but as you see more and more ventilator waveforms, you will see that the actual equation of motion is always there on the ventilator screen. And the way it is there on the ventilator screen is on that black diagram. You have the volume time, above that you have flow time, and then you have pressure time. Each piece is actually one component of the equation of motion. You combine all of them, you get pressure on one side equal to the work done by the resistive load and the elastic load. And if you summate them, you get the entire equation of motion. And that's the beauty. This is the physiological reason why no single mode has shown superiority. Because if you look at volume control with a ramp waveform, you can make changes on your settings and make it look almost like pressure control. Right? So the point here is that if you're looking at the load, the elastic load and the resistive load, as the breath progresses, the green shaded area, which is the resistive load, the, the work that the ventilator is doing to open the airways, the resistive load actually comes down. And the blue segment, which is the elastic load, actually goes up. And this can happen in any mode. It doesn't have to be VC or PC. That doesn't matter, actually. The settings are only designed to break this complexity down, but you need to be able to see it in real time in front of your eyes to define where you need to make these changes. So how do you look at the load? So in volume control, for example, you have your standard square wave on the top diagram. You want to see those deflections in the waveform to analyze the load. So if you're going from um, you know, a certain pressure step up right at the beginning of the breath right here. If it becomes green, you know that there is a resistive load. So that, that initial step up itself is a clue that this is a high resistance system. If you see that there is a, the one that is similar to the red dotted line, that means P mass is present. The patient is generating effort, pulling that waveform downwards. That is an example of the load in volume control. Similarly, you can look at the load and pressure control. And pressure control, you would have seen this a lo lot of times at the bedside, but actually understanding how it relates to the work of breathing and to the equation of motion is key. Most of it is a 
black line in a passive patient. If a patient has IPF, stiff lungs, you will see a very sharp decline. And you need to analyze that sharp decline as an elastic load. If you see that your pressure control uh, waveform actually has a, uh, the, the shape of that red dotted line, it means that the patient is taking extra effort and changing and deflecting the flow waveform, adding on to the load. So, again, we'll do this in practice for one case, but let's break this down further when we reach the patient ventilator interactions. The red tracing is the PMUS, it is the esophageal pressure tracing, and you have different types of trigger. You have normal, when the ventilator is in sync with what the patient wants. You have a late trigger, meaning the patient has asked for a breath, and it takes more than 100 milliseconds for the ventilator to deliver a breath. Why 100? It's arbitrary, but it comes from the fact that maybe at around 100 to 150 milliseconds, there is a lack of synchrony between what the patient wants and it's clinically significant. It manifests as external work. And if it becomes clinically significant, then you can consider treating it. The other one is early trigger, where the ventilator is triggering it too early and then the breath of the patient starts. So you can see that ventilator triggers early, and then the actual muscular activity of the patient happens later in the breath. This is also called reverse trigger in old literature, but we're trying to define it, trying to structure it. Um, and this can lead to asynchrony later. There's also failed trigger, which is common in COPD, for example, where the patient is trying to trigger something, but the ventilator is not responding. False trigger is like cardiac oscillations uh, that, that you would have noticed where, you know, things happen and the, you know, the, there's no desire from the patient to get a breath and the patient is given a breath. Um, similarly, you will see these things uh, causing double trigger, but the fundamental problem is actually with the trigger itself. In the sense, the patient has a very large inspiratory effort in C and it triggers two breaths back to back. So again, we are trying to standardize some of these terminologies. We've already talked a little bit about work shifting. But this is a real example from a patient where the dotted line is supposed to be the normal load. But if you see that the patient has changed it and made it more convex, that is where you say that the patient has a lot of work shifting, where the patient is doing a lot of work and the ventilator is doing less work. So you need to analyze these patterns. Similarly, you'll see this in, in VC also, which we usually call flow starvation. But work shifting is a more applicable term because the work is being moved from the ventilator to the patient. You can see that the red tracing is a lot of work. There's no deflection in the flow tracing because flow is fixed by the ventilator. But there's a huge deflection in the, in the pressure waveform. So this is work shifting in your favorite mode, which we talk about frequently, is PRVC. And in PRVC, when you have work shifting, the work done by the ventilator increases if the patient is not working enough. But if the patient is actually working harder and harder, as you see on the other side, the work done by the ventilator actually comes down. And sometimes you don't want that. Sometimes you, if there's a struggling patient, you actually want to support them. So the ventilator is doing exactly the opposite of what you want, which is again that diagram of safety, comfort, and liberation. Cycle very quickly is when the ventilator should stop giving the breath and you can have normal, late, or early cycle. This is from the same paper. This is that framework that I want to share with you and you should practice this. Um, you know, we can share the presentation and again, look at methodologies on how to do this over and over again. So in our group, if we get a picture like this, we would actually break that down in the same format. We will first tag the mode. We'll say, okay, it's volume control with CMV with a set point targeting. Then we will go down into the load. We'll see that there's a deflection between the red and the blue arrow. There's a deflection downwards. This is a PMUS. We will define the PMUS in inspiration. We look at expiration and see it should look like the magenta line, but it's not hitting the baseline. So there is some auto peep. There may be some effort by the patient. Therefore, this is expiratory PMUS and maybe some resistance. So we'll flag that. Then we'll go to the PV relationship and look and see the ventilator started the breath here at the yellow circle, but patient effort came in the red line, in the red arrow. That means it is early trigger. The patient did not want the breath at this time. The patient wanted the breath where the green circle is. So we define this as early trigger because the ventilator gave the breath, then the patient's PMUS kicked in. Clearly you can see that breath number three, breath number one and breath number you know, two are all different. The one that is most, simil uh, most similar to traditional VC is actually the middle one. So you need to analyze what happened in these two breaths and you conclude that there was an element of early trigger here. 
then we look at cycle if it is passive exhalation the the expiratory peak flow will be high but here the peak flow is actually lower than the first breath and the second breath meaning that there was a problem with the cycling leading to early cycle the ventilator was stopping the breath earlier than when the patient wanted to stop and this this construct will need practice it will need time but you have to be systematic and the point about ventilator waveforms is to actually keep doing this over and over again so typically in our vent rounds in our group we would post an image like this and each image we would practice how to do the tag how to do the load and go through the pv relationship breath by breath and break each of them down so the red box that i highlighted was that in that red box you have early cycle so the ventilator has cycled off and the patient still does not want to cycle patient still have has effort and that effort leads to a double trigger so merely saying double trigger is actually not sufficient you want to know why that double trigger happened and that double trigger can happen due to either a trigger abnormality or a cycle problem so what is around the corner this is my last slide and this is a picture from hamilton's new mode called intellisync and what hamilton is doing is exactly what i've described they are doing the exact same thing the top part is with intellisync off and the bottom part is with intellisync on what it is doing is looking at each step of the breath systematically and seeing if the patient wanted to exhale meaning was it an early cycle or was it an ineffective trigger or a failed trigger according to the algorithm and if it finds that out it will actually give the breath when it senses the lack of trigger it will terminate the breath if it sensed an early, early cycle so as a clinician if you have this framework and let's say you have an advanced mode coming to your bedside tomorrow you want to know exactly why the mode is doing what it is doing and if it is inappropriate so these things are around the corner and this is already uh, being sold right now in the market on the hamilton ventilator but it is based on the same framework so questions or comments um, again this was an attempt to break down complexity so it's going to take time to practice and get this right but of all the questions i've had in the last few years to get one source i think this is the closest we've got and so happy to share that paper with uh, with all of you there are it's about 16 pages two papers and if you read them i think both experienced clinicians and and trainees will find some benefit out of it thank you thank you dr dilip for this extremely lucid talk it has really made us understand the loops and the curves better on the ventilator of course there has to be a systematic approach and practice which will make it much better so now uh, next speaker is dr mrinal sarkar he is a well known uh, faculty in the india indian society of critical care medicine he is director intensive care fortis noida hospital and uh, he is going to talk on ventilator strategy in covid his practical experience thank you uh, uh, organizers this is the first time in all these years i have actually been invited to an anesthetics conference so th that's a new experience for me <clears throat> we all know these steps of ards management uh, this august gathering is well aware of the various steps so you first look for ards actively then uh, depending on the ventilation requirement we can use uh, peep adjust the peep adjust the neuro start neuromuscular blockade or go for proning and of course if nothing works ecmo <clears throat> the surviving sepsis guidelines told us that managing covid associated ards was no different from ards uh, of any other etiology so i could have ended my lecture here itself so what are there any differences really well it's a heterogeneous disease different phenotypes different pathophysiology with more of endothelial injury limited oxygen supply which was a uh, an equipment drug shortage which was a major issue healthcare was tremendously under stress and a pandemic situation where we were learning every day how to deal with new set of knowledge so these are the few things i'm going to speak about so i'll just skip this slide 
So first is uh, there was a postulate that there are two types of ARDS, the L type and the H type in COVID. The L type, the lung was more uh, compliant and this was essentially because of a vascular problem. Whereas H type with the more conventional stiff lung or the uh, kind of ARDS we deal with on every day basis. So, and we did also find something very unusual that patients tolerated hypoxemia much better. Uh, the so-called happy hypoxemia. The exact mechanism is not clear. The peculiar features of uh, CARDS was respiratory compliance remained preserved even though the oxygenation was quite bad. Uh, the response to hypoxia patients increased their tidal volume thus don't become tachypneic and uh, possibly it is working through some neuronal pathway. So the sensation of breathlessness was not there despite hypoxemia. Then vascular injury was a very important component of uh, COVID associated ARDS and uh, the, there was loss of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction VQ mismatch was major contributors of hypoxemia in the early stages. Subsequently, microthrombi or even major thrombi in various vascular components uh, were uh, there which were contributing to the clinical uh, situation scenario. Then we came across this concept of patient self-inflicted injury. So it was basically capillary leak le leading to lung edema, impaired gas exchange, increased respiratory drive and uh, therefore a uh, patient who was spontaneously breathing was actually breathing in a manner which was causing injury to his lungs. Uh, we associated something like this with poor ventilatory strategy on a patient on a ventilator but the concept of patients who was ventilating on uh, his own producing injury to the lung was new. And uh, essentially three categories of patients uh, clinically. The mild disease, uh, the SpO2 was more than 97%. You just needed uh, observation and symptomatic treatment. A moderate disease, the saturation was less than 94 on room air. And uh, simple oxygen devices or NIV or HFNC was good enough. And severe disease, of course, uh, was saturation less than 90% on room air and we needed uh, invasive ventilation and more and more we were using NIV. Now there was this huge fear and rightly so to an extent of uh, the infected particles being generated by the devices that we were using on COVID patients and therefore causing risks to the uh, healthcare workers. And this is a nice uh, paper looking at uh, various things. And uh, the, as we can see, the distance to which the dispersion of uh, the infected particles is supposed to have come. And we can see even simple things like oxygen venturi mask or a oronasal mask or a nasal cannula, the dispersion was supposed to be 100 centimeters. Interestingly, NIV via a helmet with a tight air cushion around the neck the, there was negligible air dispersion. So uh, the most commonly used were of course variable performance devices uh, which we use on a uh, day-to-day basis in regular ICUs. The HFNCs came into uh, limelight. The only issue was the, the equipments were in short supply and even more so oxygen was in short supply. Many patients did pretty well on HFNC if we had the oxygen to drive the machines. It was a very simple device. Nurses learned very quickly how to deal with it and it was effective. Uh, NIV uh, initially was thought to be a problem in uh, COVID because there was this fear that the, all the healthcare workers would get infected because of the aerosols being generated. As the pandemic progressed, the understanding of NIV benefits became uh, more apparent. Also, we realized very quickly that we were short of ventilators and, and skilled hands which, which could handle uh, patients on a ventilator. And so two together uh, helped us use NIV more and more as, as the uh, pandemic progressed. Uh, very careful patient selection was necessary. So if you keep a patient on NIV who needed an immediate ventilation, we were obviously harming the patient.
The patient obviously had to be fully conscious, hemodynamically stable, hypoxemia not very, very severe, work of breathing reasonable. Two types commonly used were face mask and the helmet. Helmet were used less often, face mask was used more commonly. Once the NIV is applied, of course, we needed to keep observing the patient. If he was deteriorating or not doing well on NIV, we had to switch to an invasive ventilation in time. The, the risk of uh, aerosolization was uh, perhaps overhyped because everybody was in, the, in, the, in those uh, uh, suits to keep themselves safe. Uh, we also introduced uh, using a bacterial viral filter in the circuit. So if, a, if there was a, there's us, if you were using a standalone NI, uh, NIV machine with a single circuit, single limb circuit, we were putting a filter before the expiratory leak from this circuit. So that's the change we made. Uh, there was, of course, the usual uh, issues of pressure ulcers, um, eye redness, leaks, intubation delays because you put on the NIV and forget about the patient. Uh, that's a problem. And of course, patient induced a lung injury could be a big issue if we kept on using NIV while the patient was not doing well. Proning on NIV was something which uh, all of us quickly learned to do and uh, it wasn't very difficult especially when using a face mask. Our, we used uh, helmet uh, from the very beginning of uh, the COVID and actually it was not a, a practice usual in my unit. But we adapted once I uh, read that paper which said the infection to the healthcare workers is much less. And it was pretty easy. We needed a learning time of one patient to use this helmet. Uh, as, as you well know, it consists of a transparent hood, improves tolerability, le air leak is much less, designed to allow increased titration of beep, and helmets have been associated with lower rate of intubation and mortality in non-COVID patients. So this is our publication in the Indian Journal of Critical Care Medicine. And uh, we looked at our first 30 patients uh, treated with helmet. We found that the mean PFR for, uh, before helmet application was 129 plus minus 42, well below the traditional cutoff of 150. Uh, we had 70 percent success, and the remaining nine had to be intubated, and they were obviously severe. Eight of them died. Uh, when we looked at the difference between the two, we found that the earliest change, there was a divergence of improvement in PF ratio in the two sets of patients, those who failed helmet and IV and those who uh, did well on helmet and IV. And this change was seen as early as two hours on a helmet. So of course, at that point of time, we, were, we didn't have the analysis. We were just uh, flying the aircraft with the seat of our pant. And the analysis came retrospectively. There were, of course, issues with uh, intubation. There was a lot of fear as to infection that uh, the healthcare workers would do. And many of us got these kind of boxes made. And of course, uh, a video laryngoscope became a standard of care in the ICUs. <clears throat> there was, of course, uh, the, uh, fear that intubating patients late could be harming the patients and so uh, particularly uh, keeping them on NIV. Uh, but is this really true? See, uh, the early intubation decreases the risk of aerosolization, prevents uh, P. silly, prevents emergence of uh, intubation or CVS, uh, emergent intubation and CVS collapse, uh, needs uh, to have ample ventilators and skilled manpower. Late intubation often led to not needing intubation in good number of patients and decreased manpower requirement. You could do with high different modes of oxygenation and NIV. And uh, literature did show that uh, in COVID, uh, meta-analysis showed that uh, timing of intubation may not affect the mortality and morbidity in critically ill patients with COVID-19. These results might justify a wait and watch quite different from the usual uh, thought process in other non-COVID patients. So there was a decent justification to keep watching the patient carefully and many of them we got away without ventilating. 
the uh, our own experience with longer NIV trials and delayed intubation appears to be safe and clinically feasible. Many of them uh, we would debate uh, two, three times in a day whether to jump in and intubate, and we kept postponing, and the patients got out nicely. Uh, of course, we had to keep a close eye. Uh, avoid, it did in, avoid a lot of intubation, decreased, and given the nurse shortage of nurses, it was important. The signs of NIV failure, of course, had to be carefully watched for. Uh, the CARDS intubation, uh, the, uh, went, once they were put on invasive ventilation, was no different from standard ARDS ventilation, and all of us are quite familiar with it. <coughs> The, uh, this was the supposed uh, progression of the disease to the L type, higher uh, near normal compliance, lung recruitability and low lung weight and low VQ mismatch. Uh, the strategies was low PEEP and liberal tidal volume versus H type or the late ARDS where high uh, lung recruitability but low compliance and the lung weight, lung was more wet. And proning, of course, helped in these patients. The treatment of hypoxemia was uh, standard again, proning, neuromuscular blockade, recruitment maneuvers, and ECMO. The uh, PROSEVA uh, trial showed that uh, uh, proning was very, very useful. In, this was in non-COVID patients, and we, we used it extensively in COVID ARDS patients as well. Uh, as I'm sure every other unit did. The, there was, uh, it's supposed to have decrease in villi, uh, increased drainage of secretions and increase in FRC. Uh, we know how it works. Uh, awake proning was simple cost-effective maneuver, also known as COVID-associated repositioning and proning. So we come out with fancy uh, acronyms all the time. Data is supposed to be not very robust, but all of us actually observe improvement in oxygenation with proning. It is shown to slow the respiratory deterioration in some COVID-19 patients, may reduce demand for invasive ventilation, and can also be done with patients on HFNC, NIV, and even HelmNet NIV. So we know, uh, we all of us are familiar with the proning in awake patients. And this is an uh, example, this is a, uh, not a patient, but somebody who is trying to demonstrate how uh, on a helmet patient could be prone. And we did use in uh, quite a few of our patients on helmet uh, proning if they were compliant enough. And some of them were. <coughs> Coming to a neuromuscular blockade of a patient on a ventilator, accurate trial reduced, showed reduced 90 day mortality with 48 hours of cis atracurium infusion. The recent ROSE trial, however, found no difference with neuromuscular blockage. Practically, muscle relaxants help in facilitating ventilation, particularly in the initial phase. And it has, of course, comes with the downside of having critical illness, uh, neuropathy, myopathy. The duration, of course, should be kept minimum. Uh, recruitment uh, is a big problem, in particularly in COVID, because anyway, they had a great tendency of air leaks, so pneumothorax, pneumomediastinum, subcutaneous emphysema, we saw tons of them, uh, much more than our average uh, critical care uh, experience. It may occur even in absence of mechanical ventilation. We saw even patients on simple oxygen or on NIV getting uh, the leak syndrome. So recruitment maneuvers, of course, would have increased the risk. A recent ART trial showed that recruitment maneuvers actually were associated with increased mortality. So in our ICU, we, we avoided completely use of recruitment maneuvers in COVID ARDS. Uh, we were in doing ECMO in a unit for COVID-19, and there is limited limited uh, data on this. Uh, some of the earlier papers said that there was high mortality associated with ECMO usage in COVID-19. Later, uh, they found that approximately 45% of the patient the patients survived through COVID, but many of them either needed conventional ventilation or needed prolonged critical care support even afterwards. And uh, some of these centers in India were doing remarkable work with ECMO. But one thing was sure, and there was enough data on that, was not to set up new units 
to do ECMO in COVID-19, but those who had enough experience were well-established ECMO centers, they should be taking up these patients. And of course, on an ECMO, there was an opportunity to use ultra lung protective ventilation and give the lung some rest and allow it to improve. And the uh, treatment, of course, is cost intensive and manpower intensive and there is a learning curve. So new unit was in the brilliant, most brilliant idea when we were short of manpower, short of every possible thing uh, under the earth as far as critical care was concerned. But established centers did good job. So uh, thank you so much for inviting me for today's talk. Thank you, Dr. Sarkar, for giving a practical approach. So COVID ARDS did teach us some new things, like use of helmet. As you said, even we never used it, only during COVID time. Second was awake proning, which really came up. And again, maybe during session, we'll have early versus late ARDS, how you decide to ventilate them. Because that was always a question, you know, when the patient was in the unit, when to intubate. Not that normal PF ratio and also we'll have question at the end of the session. Right. But I think that was again a little difficult decision at the bedside. So, but it taught us all these things. So it, it did uh, teach us to use our clinician's hunch all yes. the time, which was better than any figures on the ventilator. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you very much. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Deepak Sharma, who is an anesthesiologist and intensivist at Vindi Hospital, Deva, MP. He is going to talk on managing acute liver failure in ICU. So good morning, family. Uh, as uh, told by all the seniors, I am here to uh, revise acute liver failure with all of you. And uh, it's a privilege uh, to, uh, to be speaking over here and more so having Dr. Sudha as moderator for my time because uh, she is one of my e-gurus and uh, she is the one who has taught me ABG. To be precise, all my ABGs are her slides only. So, uh, so much. one more thing, being youngest, uh, uh, blessings are taken for granted. So, uh, acute liver failure. Uh, in general, we recognize liver injury when icterus occurs and we call it acute liver failure when patient develops uh, encephalopathy, coagulopathy and uh, ascites. So acute liver failure it is a very rare but rapidly progressive and most often a fatal illness. Uh, it is actually an unpredictable sequelae of uh, acute liver injury uh, characterized by encephalopathy which is usual Coagulopathy, that is INR more than 1.5, which is very frequent in individuals with previously normal liver of less than 28 weeks duration. Actually, this uh, uh, interval between onset of ecterus and onset of encephalopathy is important for prognostication. This interval uh, decides whether the patient will survive or not. So, worldwide, uh, various classifications have been given like uh, O'Grady system, Renault system, Japanese system. They have uh, conventionally uh, called it uh, fulminate, acute, subacute kind of things. But most acceptable is uh, the King's classification which calls it hyperacute when it occurs within seven days, mostly because of virus, paracetamol to uh, toxicity and ischemia. They call it acute when it is between 8 to 28 days and they call it subacute when it is from uh, 5 to uh, 26 weeks. These different etiologies, they affect the prognosis uh, of the illness and also this interval they, as, as he stated earlier. And uh, these are various etiologies. We all know we don't need to go in details of this from uh, virus to toxins to ischemia to shock. Everything can cause acute liver injury that can lead to acute liver failure. In India, like in Western world, we see that uh, the causes are, are uh, very heterogeneous from uh, uh, and most commonly it is paracetamol toxicity. But in India, most commonly ALF is caused by uh, virus. And in general, uh, the interval of uh, icterus and uh, that is IEI and encephalopathy, this interval is usually four weeks. So in Indian context, we define it as an ecteric illness with onset of encephalopathy within four weeks only. Uh, 
few patients may present from four to eight weeks. They are mostly because of toxicity of drugs. Then uh, drugs most commonly encountered in India causing uh, ALF or anti-tubercular drugs because we all know that uh, uh, tuberculosis is very frequent in India and uh, it is over-treated also. Again in South India they have found rat poison to be a very common cause and that alternative source, alternative methods of medicine they are now becoming very common and just not to criticize anyone but they are causing uh, acute liver failure very frequently. <coughs> In tropical countries like India, uh, any patient presented with jaundice encephalopathy, some uh, very common illnesses have to be ruled out like falciferum malaria, dengue, leptospira and script typhus with all their specific tests. Now this figure uh, shows that almost all the organ systems are involved because liver is the powerhouse of our body from destruction of toxins to productions of uh, life-saving molecules, everything is there in the liver. So, Coagulation, hemodynamic, brain, everything will be gone. So, these are the causes of death in patients with acute liver failure. That is cerebral edema leading to raised ICT and herniation of brain stem, sepsis, renal failure, and GI bleed. When a patient comes, I'll start evaluation the way uh, I do it for every critical patient. The thing is that age less than 10 and more than 40 have poor prognosis. A female patient has, especially of childbearing, has a poor prognosis. If the interval of ecterus and encephalopathy is less, that is, it happens between 10 days, that is hyperacute, it has a better prognosis. Then we have to take history of all other possible causes. This is work of just like say, any critical patient, more uh, uh, the uh, focus being on arterial ammonia, which if more than 150 can correlate with encephalopathy. And if more than 300, it is coma and chances of herniation are too high. But let me stress that every patient with ectrus and encephalopathy has to be seen for, uh, seen, uh, for left heart failure because it's, it can be congestive uh, liver failure as well. So uh, to rule out certain causes, specific causes, we need to do certain specific tests like if patient is young, we will look for Wilson disease. And uh, we need to do uh, ANA antibodies, anti-Smith antibodies if autoimmune hepatitis is suspected. And CCC, CECT abdomen to rule out any malignant cause. And USG Doppler to uh, see if it is ischemic. Liver biopsy is indicated. This is a very important test done through transjugular route. And it helps to exclude any occult malignancy to provide etiologic information and assess the liver for evidence of regeneration. <coughs> If it shows more than 70% necrosis in the sample, then 90% chances the patient will die. One important thing is that in India, usually ALF occurs in nave liver. So outcome usually depends upon the capacity of regeneration. So this liver biopsy very clearly uh, shows us how the capacity of regeneration is. Prognosis, it's very simple. If Grade of encephalopathy is high, patient will die. If it is hyperacute, that is less than 10 days, then patient may serve, patient will survive. If patient is having renal failure or hyperlactatemia, then prognosis is poor. The prognosis is very good if liver transplant is done early. So these are grades of encephalopathy. This is just an spectrum of neuropsychiatric abnormalities seen in patients with liver dysfunction. Actually, astrocytes, they uh, metabolize ammonia. And uh, the metabolite get uh, that is uh, uh, glutamine get collected inside astrocytes, and if it is in excess, it will cause swelling and brain edema. That, along with inflammation, causes raised ICT. So this old age uh, Parson Smith scale of hepatic encephalopathy from grade zero to four, starting from subclinical state, that can be seen only on neuropsychiatric scaling up to coma. Why this prognostication is important? Because these poor prognosis factors, they tell us who to be sent for transplant and who to be treated medically. Because liver transplant is the only best possible option we have for uh, acute liver failure patients. And if patients are sent earlier for liver transplant, they can survive. So various prognostic uh, uh, Various models for prognostic prognostications have been uh, advised all around the world, including King's College criteria, 
Clichy criteria and model of for end stage liver disease, but in India they really are not uh, very precise because you know again in in India this acute liver failure occurs in nerve livers, so it totally depends upon the capacity of to uh, of liver to regenerate. So <coughs> in Indian patient that alfat model is supposed to be the best. This is a ALF early dynamic model. It was basically constructed. Uh, uh, based on whether the level of predictive variables remain persistently high or they go up in first three days. So it s shows the dynamic nature of uh, uh, liver progress of uh, liver failure patients. So these are the variables hepatic encephalopathy, INR, arterial ammonia and serum bilirubin. They all are given points 2, 1, 2, 1 and each of these variables are actually independent predictors as a baseline. But on day three, their values are more important. So they show which way the patient is going. On day three, a score of four is associated with 90% mortality, while as in a score of one is associated with about 5% mortality. With increasing score, mortality increases. So, and this is the most uh, commonly used uh, prognostication uh, table in world that did King's College and hospital criteria originally advised for prognostication but now it is used to uh, select the patient for liver transplant separately for acetaminophen induced liver failure and for not not non acetaminophen liver failure depending upon various variables this is the most accepted criteria in the world to select liver transplant patients again clichy criteria from france uh, they use factor 5 levels if it is less than 20% of normal in patients less than 30 years of age or less than 30% of normal in patients more than 30, uh, 30 years of age, it has a very good pro pro positive predictive value of 82% and negative predictive value of 98%. So management, it has been, uh, uh, we have been using the INASL uh, consensus guidelines and uh, by using these guidelines, almost 50 to 60 percent of the patients of acute liver failure are being saved in India. The interstitial components remain the same, including high volume plasma exchange, which is now being increasingly used. It is defined as almost 15 percent of total body weight or 8 to 12 uh, liters of FFP. It has uh, been, it, it has been uh, shown in recent trials to improve transplant free survival in India. Especially that uh, we have uh, uh, learned earlier that rat poison and many toxins are increasingly being common cause of uh, acute liver failure in India. So high volume plasma volume uh, uh, plasma exchange is becoming more and more popular. So general supportive measures just like any critical patient, uh, ABC uh, managing glucose, managing temperature, managing <coughs> electrolytes, they are very critical to be on critical values. So very important thing is not to disturb the patient because encephalopathy patient, he is very irritable. And if we give any external stimuli that can increase ICT and ICT at any point can kill the patient. NAC, that is N-acetylcysteine. To be honest, to be precise, this is a specific antidote of paracetamol poisoning, but do use it. Do use it in all liver failure patients. It, uh, it uh, replenishes glutathione stores and prevents the development of hepatotoxicity if given within first 8 to 10 hours. Important is how long to continue it. It should be continued until we get improvement in encephalopathy states rather than the time or uh, paracetamol levels. So these are the specific treatments for a specific cause like for amenita, we will use penicillin, jebin. For acute fatty liver of pregnancy uh, now, Termination of pregnancy is not generally recommended. Patient should be managed conservatively if uh, full term is not raised. For, to, for autoimmune illness, we will use immunosuppressive therapy for acyclovir, lamivudine for uh, oviral infections. Encephalopathy, uh, we have been generally using lactulose, the target being 8 to 10 stools in a day and also non-absorbable antibiotics like uh, neomycin and rifaximin for sterilization of gut. But now studies have shown that these are not very effective things. Raised ICP is the most important cause of death and the thing that has to be managed in liver failure patients. I identified by hyperventilation, pedicardia, focus seizures, disaggregation and absent pupillary reflexes.
वन वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग प्यू सर की जय हो ट्रांसक्रेनियल डॉपलर कैन बी यूज टू एस एस नॉन इन्वेजिवली रेज्ड आई सी पी सी टी कैन बी डन टू रूल आउट अदर पैथोलॉजीज द टारगेट शुड बी लेस देन फिफ्टीन मिलीमीटर एंड मोर इंपॉर्टेंटली सी पी पी शुड बी टारगेटेड टू फिफ्टी टू सेवेंटी जनरल रिकमेंडेशन फॉर मैनेजमेंट ऑफ आई सी पी आई जस्ट नॉट टू डिस्टर्ब द पेशेंट टेल द हेड टू थर्टी टू फोर्टी डिग्रीज रिमूव एनी कॉन्सेक्टिंग टेप्स मिनिमाइज चेस्ट एंड चेस्ट फिजियोथेरापी एंड की पी सी ओ टू ऑफ थर्टी टू थर्टी फाइव मोर इंपॉर्टेंटली फीवर हैज टू बी ट्रीटेड बाई सरफेस कूलिंग एंड एडिक्यूट सीडेशन एंड एनालिसिया नीडेड मैनी टॉल हाइपोटोनिक्स लाइन देर इज एन ऑन गोइंग डिबेट विच इज बेटर सम पीपल से दैट हाइपोटोनिक्स लाइन इज बेटर एंड सम पीपल से प्रिफर मैनी टॉल बायोबिचुरेट कोमा कैन बी यूज इंड्यूस्ड हाइपोथर्मिया कैन बी यूज बट अर्ली ट्रांसप्लांट इज द की इन्फेक्शन प्रोफाइलेक्सिस एंड सर्वेलेंस द सेकेंड मोस्ट कॉमन कॉज ऑफ डेथ इन एलएफ पेशेंट इज सेप्सिस ऑलमोस्ट ट्वेंटी परसेंट ऑफ द पीपल डाई ऑफ सेप्सिस एंड मोस्ट कॉमन साइट्स ऑफ इन्फेक्शन आर लंग किडनी एंड ब्लड एंड मोस्ट कॉमन ऑर्गेनिजम आर ग्राम नेगेटिव्स बट फंगल इन्फेक्शन आर सीन इन ऑलमोस्ट थर्टी परसेंट ऑफ द पेशेंट्स सो सर्वेलेंस हैज टू बी डन इन ईच एंड एवरी पेशेंट ऑल पॉसिबल कल्चर शुड बी शेंड बिफोर स्टार्टिंग एंटीबायोटिक्स एंड if patient is in his advanced stages like 3 and 4 grade encephalopathy or reflectric uh, refractory hypotension or patient is having systemic inflammatory response syndrome then empirical antibiotic should be started <coughs> generally third generation cephalosporins are preferred and fluconazole for uh, fungal and then depending upon local antibiogram we can uh, add on empirical therapy sedation and analgesia are very important because irritability is the thing that has to be avoided any how patient should not be stimulated from outside and propofol is the drug of choice if if we need opioids we can uh, we would go for again shorter acting like fentanyl and ramifentanil and if muscle relaxation is needed atropurine will be the drug of choice bleeding diastasis that number should not be treated that charles sir told in first lecture number should not be treated never give prophylactic ffp or platelet transfusions they are by definition coagulopathic they have vitamin k deficiency because of uh, lack of synthesis function of liver they don't have coagulation factors in their blood but transfusion should be done only when patient is actively bleeding or any intervention surgical intervention is planned vitamin k supplements yes should be given to all patients upper gi bleed most commonly because of coagulopathy only or in, or bleed from peptic ulcer so uh, coagulopathy should be corrected if it is bleeding and uh, ppi infusions that is all that is needed nutrition is one of the most missed part in icu care not only in liver but in all patients this is the thing all intense we should focus on because acute liver failure is a a bad state it is a catabolic state patient needs high calories and patient is not just capable of handling proteins so increase proteins gradually as much as possible as we all know general rules of uh, nutrition enteral feeding should be started as early, as early as possible and tpn should be given only if absolutely indicated caesar prophylaxis this is not recommended but one thing has to be noted that non convulsive seizure activity is very common in alf patients so uh, eeg should be done when uh, this is a stage 2 or 3 encephalopathy uh, and uh, there is sudden neuro uh, neuro deterioration there is myoclonus or to titrate the bibrucirate doses and drug of choice will be phenytoin whenever needed and propofol cvs dysfunction again this is a high state low uh, svr state high output uh, low svr state drug of choice to correct blood pressure will be noradrenaline and second will be uh, vasopressin as in general uh, in critical care management map target is 70 but always correct hypoglycemia before starting vasopressin sharma can you please summarize yes ma'am so by using judicial treatment and early liver transplant alf patient can be saved uh, this is all that we have to say thank you so much
presentation. Uh, and uh, you know, liver transplantation, as he said, that was a very, very important statement which he made. You know, if your center does not have facility for liver transplant, this patient should be shifted to liver transplant unit at the earliest. Don't wait too long. Because he showed that the mortality is very high if you do not do a liver transplantation, the patient require it. So I think next we can have questions in the tea session. Uh, next topic is uh, by Dr. Nevin Chinan. He is a director ICU Manning Hospital, Regional New South Wales, Australia. He is going to talk on antibiotic dosing in critical illness. Good morning, everyone. I'm aware that uh, we're running slightly behind schedule and everyone's patiently waiting for the tea. I'll try to make it brief. Okay, so. So antibiotics is one of those class of drugs which we use quite, quite a lot in intensive care. And when we look at the evidence, the evidence actually suggests it's actually for patients in septic shock, you know, early administration. You give it in the first hour, you have a survival benefit of around 10 to 12 percent. But when you try to stretch that evidence to other areas, like in, especially in surgical cohorts, starting empirical antimicrobials, when uh, you call them like culture negative sepsis, presumed sepsis, you know, fever or cult sepsis, the story doesn't really add up. There is emerging data, like fairly conclusive data to say that indiscriminate use of antimicrobials outside of patients with septic shock can cause fairly serious harm. Uh, some of those things are uh, aware to everyone, like it can cause drug resistance. We are aware that any drug can cause side effects. Some of them can be catastrophic, so that's an issue. There is a financial cost to the patient and to the system. Uh, and more importantly, one issue with indiscriminate use of antimicrobials is we're going to miss some of those non-infectious causes of uh, diagnosis and you will go in the wrong path. Uh, then there is also ethical issues. Uh, antimicrobials will save the individual patient's life, but uh, indiscriminate use would lead to emergence of resistance and then subsequently there is a societal harm to that. So uh, that's where we stand with the evidence of antimicrobial use and critical illness. Now how do you optimize antimicrobial use? You should always look into choosing the right drug at the right dose in the right route and we always follow that up with a at least attempt to have a microbiological diagnosis which what we imply is we should always try to get culture sensitivities and if possible in your lab get a MIC for that. These days with the advent of molecular testing you don't have that great time delay of two to five days to get your sensitivities and things. Uh, the PCR should be able to tell what kind of bug you're probably dealing with and that will allow you to de-escalate and taper, especially if you start on a broad cover initially. Uh, source control, uh, that's very crucial. Antimicrobials will work only when you follow it up with appropriate source control, whether surgical or percutaneous drains, removing infective catheters and devices if it's practically possible. Uh, and the next important thing is how long. Uh, there is always a tendency to do more assuming that more is better, but not necessarily the case. One of the common areas where we can minimize the use is in the prophylactic role of antimicrobial surgical prophylaxis. There is no evidence to support its use more than the first 24 hours. Pre-incision an hour before, and then subsequently three, total of three doses. That is good enough. If you're treating with uncomplicated pneumonia, five days, and then obviously depending upon uh, tissue penetrations and things uh, in meningitis, you may need it up to two weeks. So the duration primarily is dependent on two factors. One is the site of infection, whether the drug can actually reach the target site, and the next thing is the characteristic of the microbe you're dealing with. For example, if you see a patient with uh, staphylococcal bacteremia, the minimal duration of treatment is two weeks. There's no shortcuts, okay? It's different to coagulase negative staph and contaminants. If you see staph bacteremia, Minimum is two weeks, but if you think there could be prosthetic devices which could be infected, which can't be removed and things, the duration could go up to 12 weeks. So we must be mindful what we're dealing with, especially from the bug side also. And then another uh, point I want to stress with staph bacteremia is that you should always try to find out whether it's a sensitive staph, whether it's a methicillin sensitive or flu clock sensitive one, or is it resistant? Because if it is sensitive, you should continue to treat it with the 
appropriate penicillin. There is no point in continuing with vancomycin unless it is MRSA because the cure rate or the treatment failure is going to be much higher by using a bacteriostatic medication like vancomycin in these subset of patients. And lastly, when we are optimizing antimicrobial use in the cohort of patients with critical illness, we should always consider the pharmacokinetic and the pharmacodynamic principles uh, and the organ system dysfunctions we have to deal with in these patients. So this slide tries to uh, summarize how we're going to deal with this uh, dosing in critical illness with antimicrobials. There are three factors which is going to influence that. One is the drug and the PKPD properties of that. Next is the patient's physiology. And the third one is the pathogen itself. When we say pathogen, we have to look beyond just the bug. We have to look at the uh, antibiotic sensitivity as well as what's the threshold, what's the MIC we have to deal with. Uh, this has an enormous implication in the cure rate from serious infections. So uh, let's start off with what happens to the body when you're critically ill. So we are all aware that there can be substantial fluid shifts. Uh, we all call it third spacing. So in terms of what happens to the drug, what is uh, the main issue is the volume of distribution, especially for water-soluble drugs, will be fairly um, enhanced. And uh, it doesn't really change for the fat-soluble drugs because they already have a very large volume of distribution. The next aspect of uh, critical illness is the dropping of the serum albumin levels. This affects predominantly the drugs with high protein binding, uh, examples like the beta-lactams and daptomycins. And theoretically, this should increase the uh, physiologically active part of the drug, which is the free drug concentration. But in reality, this also may be influenced by the increased volume of distribution. For most practical purposes, what we notice is that the standard dosing would produce subtherapeutic concentrations. And Another important aspect we must be aware of is the augmental renal clearance in sepsis. Especially in young patients, the standard uh, doses which we pick up from MIMS or whatever pharmacobias is very likely to cause underdosing. Uh, so how this happens is in the early stage of sepsis, they will have an increased cardiac output probably from the pathology itself and also from the interventions we do, we try to uh, fluid resuscitate, use inotropes and vasopressors appropriate, eventually increasing the renal perfusion and enhance drug delivery and eventual GFR. The, the GFR is more than 130, uh, then that amounts to a augmented renal clearance, and we definitely need to increase the dose, uh, especially the loading doses of all water-soluble antimicrobials, which includes your aminoglycosides and beta-lactams, glycopeptides, which is like almost 50% of the antimicrobials which we deal with. So uh, this study shows the magnitude of the problem. Like uh, it's a pediatric study from uh, Melbourne in Australia, but what it shows is that nearly two thirds of their patient cohort had serum levels less than 10, which is fairly subtherapeutic. So uh, if we assume that, you know, by giving a gram BD of vancomycin is sort out in uh, uh, young adults, it's more than likely not. And unless you uh, intend to measure your trough levels, you're likely to miss and assume uh, treatment failure and you want to increase or change your antimicrobials to linozolate and things like that. Acute kidney injury, um, one of the common misconceptions is that you see the GFR has gone up, the renal team comes and sees and suggests, well, the GFR is only 30, now we dose correct. There is no scientific merit for that approach at all. The loading dose is dependent only on two things. You know, the dose is a product of volume of distribution and the desired plasma concentration, and it is independent of renal function. I think this is probably the most important message I have in the whole talk. When you see a patient with renal dysfunction, there is no scientific merit to dose correct for the renal impairment. However, the subsequent doses may need to be corrected if you believe those drugs are nephrotoxic or they've got other uh, buildup and consequence of that. Uh, again, if you're dealing with drugs like beta-lactam, which have got a very high therapeutic index and large margin of safety, uh, you probably shouldn't be even attempting to dose correct for subsequent doses because the consequence of underdosing is much more serious in really unwell patients as against the toxicity which you're going to get from beta-lactams. Uh, 
Aminoglycosides, um, the important decision is whether you're going to use the drug or not. It's not actually the dosing. So you have to assess the risk benefit at an individual patient level before you decide to use aminoglycosides. So there may be patients with renal impairment, but you don't have too many options. They've got a renal stent, they're back to remit with gram negative bacilli. You may have to bite the bullet and use the full loading dose. Okay? That is important to reach the peak levels, which is what is going to bring about the bactericidal effects, as well as the post antibiotic effect, which we call. The subsequent doses will need to be adjusted if you have an option by looking at their trough levels and then uh, minimize the toxicity based on that. So often what we end up doing is we will try to space it out rather than use smaller doses. Renal replacement therapy, it's a bit more uh, complicated. There are, unless you have access to uh, targeted monitoring, it's going to be fairly challenging. Uh, this is because once size doesn't fit all, all the guidelines which come from studies and MIMS may not be applicable to your patient because each individual prescription is uh, having a different clearance. So, you know, you try to extrapolate from studies or pharmacopoeia, it may be uh, fairly misleading at times. And even in this subclass of patients, what trials have shown is that underdosing is very common, even in renal failure patients, especially with vancomycin. And the data is anywhere between 10 to 50 percent. Uh, hydrophilic drugs can be cleared by uh, renal replacement therapy uh, by both modes, ultrafiltration or dialysis. The fat soluble drugs are not cleared, but again, it's important to note that the first time the drug comes in contact with the circuit, it would be adsorbed, which is a mechanical property to bind onto the circuit and the drug levels can fall. So uh, we may have to factor that into our dosing strategies. So what is optimizing antimicrobial dosing in critical illness? It relies on two factors. One is we need the sufficient concentration at the target site. And unfortunately, there are not many easy ways of doing that. The best bet we have is measuring the plasma level, which may not necessarily reflect the target site. And we'll come to that ne next slide. This could be because of the impaired drug delivery to the tissues, because of microvascular failure, or uh, there's enhancement of uh, porin or membrane transporters, or could be just the physiology of the tissue itself, like uh, blood-brain barrier to cross for vancomycin, we're aiming for a trough level of 20 to 25 as against the standard 10 to 15. So um, one size doesn't fit everyone. And if you're dealing with pneumonia, what we really need for the target is the drug concentration in the epithelial lining fluid and uh, in really difficult to treat uh, infections with acinetobacter and things, one of the options is to use nebulized antimicrobials of aminoglycosides or colostin because they've got fairly low lung penetration. But if you deliver it uh, by nebulization, the killing potential may be enhanced. Now, as the patient recovers from the critical illness, we may have to again dose correct. This is because the volume distribution is going to shrink, the vascular integrity is back, and then they're going to offload a lot of their third spacing. So this would warn uh, dose adjustments, mainly of the maintenance doses, uh, not only the absolute dose, but also the intervals between uh, repeat dosings. So there's a brief illustration of the dose response curve. Basically, when you give a bolus, there's a peak level achieved, and then there's an exponential decay, as you can see. Uh, why this curve is important is uh, because we use this as a model to classify the drugs we use in intensive care into three basic groups. So uh, concentration-dependent ones like the aminoglycosides, then drugs which are time-dependent like the beta-lactams, and then uh, time and concentration-dependent ones like the fluoroquinolones and vancomycin. So uh, from a practical standpoint of view, what we do is we just divide them broadly into two classes, hydrophilic agents or lipophilic agents. And the water-soluble ones, the hydrophilic ones, have got a smaller volume of distribution. So uh, they are more likely to be influenced a lot more in the critical case setting. Uh, they're renally eliminated, and they've got an increased clearance in sepsis, at least in the earlier part of sepsis. Whereas the fat-soluble ones, because the large volume of distribution cleared by predominantly metabolized and cleared in the liver, uh, the great advantage is that they've got a greater tissue penetration. So uh, obviously, we would like to use fluoroquinolones and 
macrolides in uh, difficult to penetrate uh, pneumonias and things like that, at least as a second agent. So uh, with this information, we can see that there is a rationale to use continuous infusions over multiple dosing with beta lactams. Uh, the evidence is a bit uh, variable, I would say. There's no demonstrated mortality benefit, but uh, this could be because of underpowered studies. From a practical standpoint of view, when trials was done using keftazidine, they found that even with a half the dose of the standard of uh, 100 milligrams per kilo per day, they were able to reach uh, higher um, plasma levels with this approach. Uh, the study was not powered to obviously demonstrate mortality benefits. Same with uh, use of piperacillin tazobactam, there was higher clinical cure rate than infusions. Uh, this approach could not be recommended for meropenem because of stability issues, uh, especially in warmer countries after 8 to 12 hours. We have a bit of uh, uh, trouble keeping them stable. Now, the last aspect uh, I want to touch base was the bacterial susceptibility in critical illness. Uh, so what it implies is that when we are dealing uh, with sicker patients who are hospital-acquired infections, even with the same bug, for example, MRSA, which comes from the community, their MIC may be 0.5, and a trough level of 10 may be enough. Whereas if you're using, uh, for hospital-acquired MRSA, the MIC may be closer to 2, and the target trough could be 20 to 25. And this could affect your judgment, you know, whether you want to use it in someone with an impaired renal function, whether you want to alternate agents. Uh, now, what are the available tools we have for optimizing antimicrobial dosing? This is probably the second last slide. And the approach is, historically, what we have done is we use an empirical starting dose by the clinicians, and then we probably look up MIMS or whatever pharmacopoeia, and then adjust the subsequent doses. A further uh, step forward was using dosing nomograms, which relies on using some of the uh, serum levels as a part of the therapeutic drug monitoring. This is an area to be uh, kept an eye on, the dosing softwares. Um, so they are not all the same. They come at different degrees of fidelity. So the imperating starting dose by clinicians and the recommended dose. This is more of a, I would say, a hype. It doesn't have any great value because it doesn't uh, integrate the information from population models and all. It is basically um, a linear regression model developed from the existing nomogram itself. Whereas uh, the subsequent or the modern versions of the Bayesian uh, ones, they take all three variables. So the patient factors or the change patient uh, physiology, they also take into the MIC of the pathogen as well as the uh, normal PKPD of the drug and uh, recommend an initial dose and then subsequently with the input you provide from the serial measurements uh, give you input. Uh, it involves principles of machine learning. So uh, not only the population data is being used, with every time you do on a patient, it will continue to refine, just like Google improves its performance. So it's more of a what's the space kind of situation now because still the models have not been uh, past the regulatory approvals. And obviously it comes with a lot of costs and extra data requirements. So what are the take home messages? We must always use the right drug at the right dose by the right route. We should ensure source control and microbiological diagnosis in a timely fashion. Attempt to de-escalate once you get this microbiological information. The dosing in critical illness depends on three main factors. One is patient's physiology, second is the PKPD of the drug, and the third one is the pathogen's MIC. In acute renal failure, the loading dose remains unchanged, and uh, if you have access, we must always aspire to do some therapeutic drug monitoring, both for efficacy as well as for safety. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kinnan, for an excellent presentation. I think we are running late. So we have two to three questions. Uh, may I request all the faculty of session to please come forward? Please. Yeah. Please come here. 
<laughs> no, it's not a jail. Yeah. Uh, any any questions uh, from the audience, please? So, if uh, no questions, we can proceed. Uh, I will like uh, a brief felicitation ceremony and uh, thanks, Dr. Sudha, uh, for conducting this session. Uh, please come forward, Dr. Priyanka. Uh, is she there? Uh, no. Dr. Abjit, uh, to hand over the uh, plaque to ma'am, please. Yeah. Next, Dr. Nitin. Dr. Nitin, please, to hand over the plaque to Dr. Vimohan. This session was designed by Dr. Vimon and we are extremely thankful to him for all the topics and all that. A big hand for him. Dr. Vikas Vikram Singh to present the memento to uh, Dr. Vibhu. Next, Dr. Garima Garg to present the memento to Dr. Dilip Raman. Having worked with Dr. Minal Sarkar, I would prefer to do that honors to him myself. <laughs> Sir, working with you was a perfect example of how two departments can come together to work for the benefit of patients. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Ankit to present the memento to Dr. Deepak. And Dr. Ajay Tikaria to present the memento to Dr. Nevin. Again, a special thanks, Nevin, for coming all the way from Australia. <laughs> so, we break for a quick tea and a very important session that is Dr. Piyush Malik oration by Madam Dr. Jayashree, Madam herself. So we break for a brief tea for 10-15 minutes and we come back. Right. Please have a tea.